Five Nights at Freddy's is a series I have a lot of conflicting thoughts and opinions on, yet I always knew I wanted to make a video about it. But there are so many topics that you could take on when it comes to this series, and many people have already made great videos on those topics, so I didn't really know what niche thing I should cover, or even where to start. But one day, I just thought, screw it. Let's cover everything. Yeah, I'm talking about it all. Five Nights at Freddy's is a franchise created by Scott Cawthon, which started in 2014 as a relatively simple point-and-click horror game that over the years has grown into a multi-million dollar franchise with nine goddamn games under its belt, a story more convoluted than my therapist's notes on me, and a horde of fans that could probably overtake all of Sweden if that meant they'd get their hands on a rare golden Freddy Funko Pop. It's considered one of the most popular indie horror games out there, and is one of the few indie games to have made it into the mainstream. This franchise holds a lot of history, ups and downs behind it, and today, I'm planning on talking about it all. Not just all of the games, but all the books, the movies, and the rest of the things you can see if you look at the chapters of this video. This is gonna be a long one, so if you're planning on watching through this whole thing, which you obviously are, consider placing yourself on something more comfortable than a kitchen chair and prepare yourself for hours and hours of me talking about this fuzzy prick. Or, if you're interested in some particular topic, like I said, there's chapters on the timeline and in the description of this video so you can skip to whichever specific thing you want. Not gonna lie, the length and contents of this video terrify me, so if you would be so kind as to like, subscribe and follow me on Twitter and Twitch, I would be very grateful. And also, if you don't do it, your family will be in active danger. And with those beginning talks out of the way, I think the best place to start off this long journey is at the start of it all. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. I meant the games! Five Nights at Freddy's 1 was created by Scott Cawthon, who after years of making games and not getting reviews any better than... It's a bit shit, innit? ...was on the verge of quitting game design. But before he left the gaming world for good, he wanted to try one last time. He had gotten feedback about the characters in his games looking like terrifying animatronics, and decided to take that critique to heart in the best way possible by intentionally making a horror game where he could let these nightmares come alive. And after months of work, the game was released on August 8th, 2014. FNAF 1 has you, the player, working as a security guard in a place called Freddy Fazbear's Pizza, a Chuck E. Cheese-styled restaurant whose main focus are these animatronics that entertain kids by singing songs and whatnot. How any child could be entertained by a thing like this is above my understanding. But lo and behold, since this game does have the horror tag on it, some spooky shit starts happening real fast. You see, the animatronics in the facility do tend to get a bit quirky at night, and once you've started your shift, start making their way towards your office so they can stuff you into a Freddy Fazbear suit, because they think you're a naked endoskeleton without a suit on. And that kind of indecency is not tolerated in this household! The only means of defending yourself against these buggers that you have are the security cameras that you'll use to keep track of all of them, the hallway lights which show you the dead spots your cameras can't see, and the doors that keep an animatronic away if one gets a tad bit too close for comfort. This would be quite a simple job, even with the disadvantage of almost dying, but unfortunately this entire establishment apparently runs on one fucking car battery, and if you use any of your defenses too much, aka waste too much energy, the power cuts out leaving you completely open for whatever happens next. So you have to balance between keeping track of where everyone is and closing doors to avoid death, but also saving your power by not using too much of anything to also avoid death. You'll continue to do this until your shift is over at 6am, when the animatronics either shut down or start having a depressive episode, I can't really tell. This is already a relatively interesting premise for a horror game. Instead of the usual horror tropes of running away from monsters or VIOLENCE, this game puts you in a spot where it feels like you can't do anything. You're stuck in this room for the next six hours, with only these measly lights, cameras, and doors to keep you safe, if you can even call a situation like this safe in the first place. You're mostly powerless and just waiting for the bad to come at you, instead of the opposite you usually see in horror games. This premise alone made FNAF 1 stand out from other horror games at the time, which mostly relied on you 
doing things, which is kind of the opposite of this game, where the entire idea is that you don't really do much. Now, a game that works with this whole less is more idea would obviously get really boring really quickly, if it wasn't for the fact that this is indeed a horror game and everything is terrifying. At least the first time you play the game. One of the biggest things that makes FNAF 1 scary is the general ambience. The ambience of the first game is still, in my opinion, the best thing about any of the games. It just feels so haunting. It's not like a something's not right type of deal. It's more of an everything is horrible but I don't know why kind of vibe, you know? Yet the game is also pretty calm a lot of the time with the whole doing nothing thing. During the first night, for example, not much actually happens, but the pure dread the atmosphere and concept of the game can cause is great and more than makes up for the lack of action in a lot of at least the early nights. Again, on your first playthrough ever of the game, after seven years of this bullshit, it's not very scary anymore. Another thing that adds to the horror of this game are, of course, the animatronics themselves. There's Bonnie, who always appears first and that's his entire thing, Chica, the second character, Foxy the dickhead, and the main man himself, Frederick von Fazbear. I mean, nowadays you can't take these things seriously because of what FNAF has become, but back when I initially saw these designs, they genuinely scared me, because an animatronic falls perfectly in the uncanny valley between a human and a robot meaning it feels like something that's alive and human, and also none of those things at the same time. I'd like to go further into this topic of why the designs of the original FNAF characters are so scary, but I lack the intellect to do so. But fortunately, I have brought a person highly skilled in 3D modeling and character design to do so for me. Eddie? Uh, you know I only do 2D animation, right? Uh... Also, what the hell is a FNAF? Okay, <laughs> never mind, I guess we won't be talking about that, but if you do want a more deep divey look into this topic, consider watching the Oof Troops videos on the designs of a few FNAF characters. But the long and short of it all is that the FNAF 1 characters were made to look sort of friendly, but at the same time uncanny, uncomfortable, and unsettling. Which is coincidentally the same way I'd describe the bus driver I interacted with today. And these key features made the characters scary, yet memorable when the game first came out. And on top of the visuals, atmosphere, and gameplay mechanics, another thing that made this game so good was the soundscape of it. I could probably go on and on about this topic if I wanted to, but another YouTuber named Scruffy has already made two fantastic videos covering anything and everything I could have ever talked about when it comes to the sound design of FNAF, so go check his videos out if you want a better look into that. But a very shortened version of the contents of Scruffy's video is that the game's soundscape consists of eerie and subtle sounds meant to either either help you, confuse you, or create further atmosphere, and all of it's fantastic. All of these aspects that are meant to scare you culminate in the final moments of a night, where after trying your hardest to stay alive, the energy levels hit zero and... You're fucked. The only thing you can do now is wait for the inevitable. Freddy arrives and starts playing a creepy music box for a few seconds until everything cuts to black and... You get a second long loop of a gif and a loud noise. That's the one disappointing thing about this game. The payoff of a jump scare just feels really annoying instead of rewarding after a few tries. Now fair enough, the jump scares in this game are done better than in many other games, considering the jump scares in this game are usually as a result of your own actions or lack thereof, instead of just being a random thing that happens when your walking simulator gets a bit too boring in the middle. And I also can't really think of anything else that could replace this final punishment for losing. But after the initial jump you get from the scare, you're just left with a feeling of... That's it. And the further into the game you go, the less effective the jump scares get. At least, that's how I felt. But anyway, when this mishmash of good and bad features gets put together, you get a good video game, nonetheless. But that's not all this game has to offer, since on top of an actual game, you also get a world. The basic story of FNAF 1 is told through the nightly phone calls you get at the beginning of each night. The guy on the phone, phone guy if you will, a very clever name, I know, gives a tutorial and tips on how to beat the game during the first two nights, but after that he just gives tiny nods to the fact that there's actually some deeper lore hiding under the surface of this game, by mentioning things such as
Now, Phone Guy only gives you the very basics and leaves you with a lot of questions. Mainly, why are the animatronics so hostile and why is this happening to me? And that's where the secret newspaper clippings come in. In the game, there are the secret newspaper clippings that occasionally appear on the walls of the pizzeria that tell you a story of five kids going missing after a mysterious killer, I'll get to you later, lost these kids into a back room where he kills them and stuffs them inside the animatronic suits to hide them. After this scandal, the restaurant starts going under due to the stigma of the place and the strange behavior of the robots, and is set to close by year's end. From this, it's pretty easy to gather that the souls of these killed kids now haunt the animatronics, and the real reason they're coming to kill you is not because they think you're participating in indecency, but because they just want some good old revenge on someone, anyone. This is how simple the story of FNAF used to be, just a cool mystery of a killer and five kids being stuffed into four Suits, that's not how math works, what the fuck? Yeah, turns out there's a secret fifth character in the game called Golden Freddy that appears sometimes in your office to cause slight mayhem for five seconds before frankly fucking off if you lift up your monitor. Back then, Golden Freddy was considered a mysterious character, whose identity we didn't know. Its ghostly behavior made it a really popular character, and it was really integral to the lore. And seven years later, it's considered a mysterious character whose identity we don't know, its ghostly behavior makes it a really popular character, and it's really integral to the lore. Damn it! Much wasn't, and still isn't, known about Golden Freddy. And it was another thing that added mystery into the game and its world. It was fun. The story in general remained simple, but left enough questions unanswered to keep people interested in what was happening in the game's world outside of the six nights you spent there. Oh yeah, did I mention that this game has six nights, despite it being called Five Nights at Freddy's? I was gonna make a joke about that, but then realized that there's not a single person on this planet who hasn't made that joke, so there's that tidbit of info in case you didn't know, and the least humorous manner possible. This addition of an interesting world made FNAF into something that could be expanded beyond the limits of the game itself. Overall, FNAF 1 was a unique game inside the horror genre at the time, with an unconventional premise and gameplay alongside good game design and an interesting story which made it stand out from everything else. The game does have small issues here and there, but on the patented FNAF scale, trademark, I'd say this is the second best FNAF game that there is. A solid A rank. FNAF 1 was released to initially moderate success, with critics saying that this was Scott's best work, but numbers showing only mild success compared to his other games. That was until a certain someone did a let's play of the game, leading it to exploding in popularity and getting Steam greenlit in a month. Immediately after the game blew up, Scott realized that this was his chance of making it as a game designer, and immediately started working on... FNAF 2 was released on November 11th, 2014, a mere four months after the first game, and has you, yet again, working as a security guard at another Freddy Fazbear's location, doing very similar things to what you did before, but with slight changes here and there. The first change you see is obviously in the gameplay. Unlike in FNAF 1, where you felt at least a little bit safe whenever you closed your doors, in this game, you don't get any doors, bitch. Everything is open and everyone is coming for you. Yeah, so instead of the nice yet slightly stressful premise of four animatronics coming at you with your only defenses being some lights, cameras, and doors, this time you have three times the amount of animatronics after you and now only have lights, cameras, and some shitty cosplay to save yourself. The flashlight and security cameras get used in the way you'd expect them to be used. You look at the cameras to track everyone and use the flashlight to flash down the dark hallway directly in front of you. But the shitty cosplay, or in other words, the empty Freddy head given to you, has more of an unconventional use. Whenever an animatronic enters your office, you can put the mask on, which confuses the robots into thinking you're Freddy and leaving you alone. Because after all, even though these things are robots possessed by kids, they are still robots. And kids so they have the intellect of bricks. You follow where everyone is through the cameras, check the hallways and newly added vents with your lights, and whenever someone tries getting into your office from the various entrance points, you put on the Freddy head to make them go away. Everything seems relatively simple at first, even with 12 whole ass animatronics coming your way. And one might even think that you can beat the entire game by just keeping the Freddy head on the entire time. But that's when these critters come in. Foxy still holds his nickname of Dickhead by being one of the only two characters in the game not to be fooled by the mask. Instead, whenever he appears down the hallway, you have to repeatedly flash your light at him to make him go away. The flashlight can also run out of power, so you need to keep track of your light usage throughout the night as well. 
The second difficult character to deal with is the Puppet, who lies inside of this music box and won't come out if you keep the box wound. But if the box becomes unwound, the Puppet comes out and it's essentially an instant game over at that point, because the Puppet can't be deterred by anything. And because the box winds down faster than my energy levels during any given day nowadays, it basically becomes your main focus for the nights. You can't wind the music box or use the flashlight when your Freddy head is on, because otherwise there'd be no gameplay, so FNAF 2 becomes yet another game of balancing tasks so you don't get killed, but this time everything's been cranked up to 11 because again, there's triple the animatronics. I like how this game tried to change things up, and initially the fact that you have so much more to keep track of and no doors gets you panicking. Your main means of defending yourself have been changed almost entirely whilst keeping some fragments of the original game's mechanics, so the whole game becomes a nice mixture of old and new. But even with all these good changes, FNAF 2 manages to become way more monotonous way faster to me than FNAF 1 for some reason. It just loses the scariness factor and I zone out completely after night 3, because at that point it's just difficult and not particularly scary anymore. Oh yeah, that's one thing I should talk about, the difficulty curve in this game. It is way too steep. I think Scott knew FNAF 2 wasn't gonna stay scary for as long as the first game because people now knew what to expect, so he made a logical decision and upped the difficulty to at least keep franticness and panic in the game if nothing else. And whilst this is a good idea in theory, uh, yeah. the execution was a bit lackluster. It's just too steep. It goes from learning how things work in the first two nights and getting a bit harder on the third to batshit difficult oh dear lord after night three. The difficulty starts feeling like compensation for the fact that the game has become not scary, even though you could have kept the scariness factor of the game alive throughout the nights by adding more creepy unexpected shit, like in FNAF 1 with the hallucinations and easter eggs and the cameras. I like the gameplay itself, but I feel like the elements that affect gameplay that aren't actual gameplay, like the difficulty curve and scariness factor, could have been dealt with a bit better. But visually, I do think this game is an improvement from the first one. I enjoy the campy, almost cozy look of the original game, but I prefer the characters and environment of this one. Starting off with the characters, and more specifically the toy animatronics, they are not scary in the slightest. Yeah, the glossy exterior and beady dead eyes add some level of uncanniness to them, but overall I find nothing to be scared of in these oversized water bottles. But I can give them one thing, and that's that they are a really nice contrast to whatever the hell this is. The Withered animatronics are the complete opposite of the toy variations, and are the only ones whose designs I find slightly scary to this day. They look so fucking good, and make up for all the stupid looking toys, and I'd say they're even better looking than the FNAF 1 animatronics. I also like the look of FNAF 2's environment. I'm not really claustrophobic, so tight spaces in games don't really evoke any kind of fear in me, but big spaces like this game's office definitely do something to make my brain go, ah! I don't know, it's just something about big spaces that makes me more uncomfortable than small ones. I guess it has something to do with the fact that there's way more places for things to come at you from. Now the visuals might be better, but I wouldn't say so for the sound department. The sounds of this game just feel like useless noise half the time. The only noise you really listen actively for are the vent sounds. Other than that, it's just FNAF 2 hallway.mp3 and nothing else. It lacks the complexity of FNAF 1's sound design and just feels less impactful, which is a shame since the sound design of FNAF 1 is one of my favorite things about that game. And the story... Deary me. So this game is a prequel, meaning the events of it happened before FNAF 1, even though a giant 2 is plastered all over it, making you think it's a sequel. And the way the lore gets revealed in this prequel is through the nightly phone calls, like in the first game, but also with these Jaguar-style 8-bit minigames. I'm tired of hearing Atari styled. These minigames give us some background to this game and the events that preceded it. It shows us how the puppet is the one who's given the animatronics life, and how there seems to be a strange purple guy present in almost every minigame. I'll get to you later. FNAF 2 gives out some interesting bits of lore and expands on the previous game's story as well, but I just didn't feel like it was as impactful or interesting. I think it's just because this game was meant to be the second part of a trilogy, and most of the time the second part reveals the least, since the purpose of a sequel in this sense is usually just to expand the details of the first installment whilst giving room for the third, and hey, 
FNAF 2 does succeed in that. But overall, it didn't leave as much of a lasting impact on me when I first saw it like FNAF 1, since all it really was to me was the story of FNAF 1 all over again, except now we know the killer has cyanosis. Even though this game has its flaws, like the gameplay that gets sort of boring after a while that compensates for this boredom by adding an unnecessarily steep difficulty curve, the soundscape being mediocre, etc, on the FNAF scale trademark, I think FNAF 2 still holds up quite well, and whilst I do not think it's as good as the first one, it's still a pretty damn good game and gets a solid B rank from me. I could have been way harsher to this game if it wasn't for the fact that it holds a lot of nostalgia for me, because this was the first FNAF game and the first horror game I ever saw. Yes, FNAF was the first horror game I ever saw, now you probably understand how I could write over a hundred pages about this shit. It's all fueled by nostalgia, baby! Fun fact, unlike most children at the time, I despised FNAF when I first saw it, mainly because it was a horror game and I didn't understand why anyone would ever play something that's meant to scare them. And because it was all that people talked about back in its heyday, every day I would hope and pray that there wouldn't be more FNAF games so people would forget about it, move on, and let me be the horror-hating 8-year-old I was. <laughs> After the even bigger success of FNAF 2, Scott knew that a third game was inevitable. Since their story at the moment was in shambles and needed closure, the idea of a FNAF trilogy was fun and money. FNAF 3 has you, yet again, playing as a security guard at… a horror attraction, surprisingly enough. So 30 years after the closing of Freddy Fazbear, some random dude wanted to make a horror attraction based on all the things that went down at the restaurants. So that happened, and now you've wound up at that horror attraction as a security guard to watch over the place. In FNAF 3, you are equipped with your trusty security cams yet again, but there's two sets of them this time around, one for the attraction itself and one for the comically large vents. Another update you've got into your camera system is the inclusion of a button that plays a child's voice in whatever room you press it on, and you use it to lure this fucker to wherever you want him to go. The fucker I mentioned about a second ago is the only animatronic you actually face in this game, who is also the antagonist of the entire franchise that was initially only known as Springtrap, but through some secrets I'll get to soon enough is revealed to be the previously mentioned purple guy, aka the killer who started this whole ordeal. Okay, we're finally talking about this. Right, so this guy right here is William Afton. We find that out through the books, but it's easier to state that now. AKA the purple guy, AKA Springtrap. He's the main antagonist of the series, who's killed almost every single person we've seen or heard of in this franchise, and who everybody inside FNAF's universe hates. But he's also at the same time basically the protagonist, because he and his family are the things the entire lore is based around, he makes an appearance of some sorts in every other FNAF game after this one, and he's the only character anyone's even interested in anymore. Oh I see how it is, he kills a bunch of kids and he becomes the most popular character in his universe, but when I do it it's considered a Felony. Basically, this guy's important. At the time of FNAF 3 coming out, the only things we knew were that he was the killer, who basically said fuck them kids in the murdery way, and that he was stuck in the Springtrap suit because of reasons I'll get to this very second. So William kills some kids because yes, and puts them inside animatronic suits. Then after a while, he realizes that the kids possess the suits and starts panicking. In this state of panic, he decides to go break the animatronics to make sure they don't come after him. But lo and behold, breaking the animatronics causes the spirits to break free of their robotic cages so they can go haunt his ass for the rest of eternity. But William, being the clever boy that he is, goes over to his iconic spring bonnie suit. Which he's used to kill most of the kids so far. It probably doesn't sound too iconic to you since I've failed to mention it at any point so far. I'm not very good at this. And wears it to, I guess, scare the ghosts away because PTSD? But the room William puts the suit on is leaking water from the roof, which is falling into his suit. The suit he's wearing is called a spring lock suit, which is a suit that functions as an animatronic and a suit. You can turn it to suit mode by unlocking the spring locks of the suit and going inside, but because engineering clearly was not the passion of the fuckers who made these, if the suit is mistreated in the slightest, the dozens of springs in the suit go jolting inside your body making you feel a big old owl. And would you look at that, that's exactly what happens to William since his suit gets tainted with water causing the spring locks to malfunction, effectively putting him out of commission for a long time. He wallows in pain for the next 30 years or so until he gets put inside Fazbear Frights, where he can finally roam around freely without anyone seeing. 
And that leads us to the present moment. Sorry if things got a bit sidetracked there, but I felt like that was the perfect moment to give the backstory of the main character of the games. So Springtrap is the only real animatronic in the game that you'll keep from entering your office by luring him as far away from you as possible with the kid voice thing I mentioned before, because even after all of this, his hunger for children is unfathomable. That sounded horrible. His AI isn't the greatest, and it's very easy for you to trap him in the farthest corners of the pizzeria where he'll be unable to reach you, making the main threat of this game not really threatening since the gameplay loop makes him seem like a complete dumbass. The only things really making this task of keeping spring trap away from you difficult are your second screen and the phantoms. Firstly, the second screen. So even though this universe has shown that it has some insanely advanced technology and robots, the ACs and computers still run like shit. Your camera, audio, and ventilation systems break constantly, and to fix them, you'll have to scoot over to the other side of the screen to get to the second monitor to click the fix button. You can choose to either fix one singular thing or to reboot everything, but the penalty of doing that is having to wait longer for things to get fixed, since apparently this guy can't tilt his fucking head to the side. But it is useful when multiple of your systems break. If you fail to fix these things in time, naturally death ensues. The biggest annoyance out of all of these three systems is the ventilation system, since not having oxygen makes you black out, making it very hard to see, but it also releases the phantoms to roam around in your head rent-free. I didn't intend to rhyme, sorry. The phantoms are the ghosts of Freddy's or whatever the hell that exists purely to be unnecessary jump scares. They're there to be distractions, to get your attention away from the only thing that can actually kill you. The way they do this is by either giving you a split second to react to one of them either being on the cameras or in your office, or by releasing Foxy that still dickhead at you at random times. The jump scares that occur from these phantoms don't kill you and instead just give you a slight scare and disorient you for a few seconds, allowing Springtrap to take a few more steps towards you. All of these mechanics form into gameplay where you lure Springtrap as far away from yourself as you can whilst trying to avoid the phantoms and dealing with the loading times of 1992 trying to fix your machinery. It is an interesting way to take the mechanics of the franchise, and I do like some aspects of the gameplay, but after Night 2 it just becomes you not getting scared by anything, trying to do the very simple tasks you were given, but failing because of RNG. But hey, at least the game looks nice. The idea of a horror attraction based off of Freddy's fits perfectly into this world, and the initial vibes of the FNAF 3 location are genuinely creepy, although that creepy factor fades away fast. Also, the character design of FNAF 3 Springtrap is the best out of any character in the franchise, but I wouldn't expect anything less from the design of the franchise's main antagonist. I got not much else to say about it, the game looks great. But what's the game sound like? Very loud. Alright, to cut FNAF 3 some slack, I enjoy that it has a more detailed soundscape than FNAF 2, with more little sounds to indicate movement and things happening around you. But it's nothing to be amazed about, and most of the time all you hear is this. So yeah, loud, moving on. This time around, Scott went full ass-blasting power mode when it comes to the secrets. Firstly, there's two endings, one you get by just beating the game and one you get by beating the secret minigames. Just like in FNAF 2, there are a ton of hidden minigames in this game, but instead of being given to you when you die, they happen if you do very specific things at very specific times. For example, locating cupcakes on the cameras, finding randomly appearing pictures in the cameras, and dialing your credit card info onto some tiles on the wall. These secrets take you to minigames that, on the surface, aren't really anything special, but can be broken, and in fact, they're meant to be broken, since sometimes you need to intentionally go out of bounds to get the true endings of each minigame. Finding all the secret minigames and the secrets inside those minigames grants you the absolutely worth it ending of the same ending screen you saw when initially beating the game, but somebody forgot to pay the electricity bill. It's kind of insane just how fast people figured these puzzles out. All of them were solved during the first week after launch. And whilst they are confusing, they are a pretty fun challenge if you don't mind some bullshittery that comes with trying to find these secrets in the first place. And the lore of this game that the secrets relate to would be really cool if the franchise had ended here. So FNAF 3 was supposed to be the last game in the series, with Fazbear's Fright burning down along with Springtrap at the end of the game. That was supposed to be it. The story was gonna be about a killer who kills some kids, puts them in animatronics, angers their souls, accidentally sets them free, gets stuck in the spring bunny suit for 30 years, and finally burns down with Fazbear's Fright at the end of the game. 
The story would have ended on a sober note and satisfied most of the people who theorized immensely about this game back then. But due to the fact that this wasn't the last game and the story continued on, FNAF 3 started to feel like another slightly too vague continuation to the story and made me kind of neglect the story aspects of this game and focus only on the game itself, which I don't think is very good. Overall, I don't like FNAF 3 much. It's not a horrible game and has elements I enjoy a lot, but the actual game aspect of the game is unfun, so unfortunately I can't give FNAF 3 on the FNAF scale trademark anything higher than a C. This was supposed to be it. The ending of FNAF. But then complaints happened. After the release of FNAF 3, Scott had gotten some complaints about it from the fanbase, saying that the gameplay of the game was quite lackluster and that the jump scares were not scary at all. I agree with this completely. And not wanting to end the series on something people weren't satisfied with, he started working on Five Nights at Freddy's 4, the supposed final chapter Lamau, that was supposed to polish up the law Lamau, and give people an actually scary experience to cap it all off. Lamau, wait, no, that actually happened. FNAF 4 was released on July 23, 2015, another four months after FNAF 3, and changed everything up drastically by making a game where you play as a child fending off animatronics from getting in your room. This game was such a big switch from what we were used to with FNAF, because there were no cameras and you get to move. This shit ain't stationary no more, you can go in four whole ass directions. It's a start. Firstly, you can go to the two doors on your left and right. Just like in the first game, Bonnie comes at you from the left door and Chica comes at you from the right door. Once you are at one of the doors, and here's the kicker, you have to listen for breathing. And if you hear it, you have to close the door until they go away, because I guess their feelings get hurt every time you close the door in their face, so they huddle back to the other side of the house to cry. If you can't hear breathing, you have to use your flashlight to further lower their self-confidence to make them back away from your door. Then there's the closet, in which Foxy, the dickhead, resides in. You have to check on him with your flashlight periodically, and if he looks like he hasn't had his morning coffee yet, you have to close the closet doors until he turns into the version of himself that he becomes after drinking his morning coffee. This is a joke for all you coffee drinkers, I guess. I don't even drink coffee, why did I write this in? And then there's Freddy, who's left you to babysit his children for the night, and if you don't check on them on the bed behind you enough, he'll come in and tell you that he will have your pay because you're a shit babysitter. Continue to do all of this until 6am, and you'll survive. Now my explanation of how this game works might have not been the scariest, but actually speaking this is probably the scariest game in the franchise. The atmosphere is haunting and actually feels scary again instead of mildly uneasy, which I've been craving since FNAF 1. Also, the game's strange setting of being inside a child's bedroom makes it easier for you to immerse yourself into it, since I feel like most people on this planet have been scared of the darkest kids, looking at the darkest corners of their homes looking for scary creatures. And speaking of scary creatures, the nightmare animatronics are something that I definitely describe as that. The designs of the nightmare animatronics are really close to looking over the top and too tryhardy, but manage to tiptoe that line of scary and stupid, and also manage to look like much scarier versions of the original animatronics. So the visuals of this game are great, but then we get to the sound department, and I'd like to file a few complaints. This is the first FNAF game to switch from mostly visual-based mechanics to audio-based mechanics, with almost all of the game relying on you listening for various things. It relies on hearing so much that you can actually beat the entire game blind without ever looking at the screen and just go off of audio cues alone. You have to listen for breathing or footsteps for Bonnie and Chica, you can hear the silent screams of the Freddles, the shitty children of Freddy I mentioned, the more irritated they get, and whilst Foxy doesn't have a listening mechanic, you can listen for footsteps to hear when he comes into the room. And whilst I respect this change in gameplay, I cannot say I enjoy it, but that's mostly my own personal issue. You see, I'm what you would call hard of hearing. 
I'm not gonna get into too much detail about this because I'm not about to tell you my medical history, but basically I am almost half deaf and have a very hard time distinguishing things like speech if there is a lot of background noise in a given environment. And that's what makes this game nearly impossible for me. I really like the sounds of FNAF 4, and in a game that's main mechanics revolve around hearing, you'll of course have some red herrings to make the gameplay a bit more difficult, but my deaf ass cannot hear the subtle breathing noises and ended up dying to Chica or Bonnie so many fucking times I can't even count it. This meant that I had to have the game volume be really loud, and whenever I'd get a jump scare it would be the loudest possible thing on earth, so after a while of playing FNAF 4 and feeling miserably my ears would hurt like hell. I know this is a very specific issue to me and the five other hard of hearing people who play FNAF, but there is a genuine issue here that I can bring up from this, which is the fact that you have to have the audio so fucking loud for this game. Even people with normal hearing have to have the audio of this game up really loud to hear the breathing, making the jump scares unnecessarily loud and that's not good game design to me. The jump scare feels way less earned when it's inevitably gonna be so loud it's gonna hurt your ears. Obviously this keeps the stress levels high at all times knowing that the scare is going to be super loud, but this way the jump scare does not feel as earned as in the past games, and I think a lot of people can agree with that. Also, yep, gameplay. Uh, it's nice. It mostly consists of you constantly moving between the two doors and occasionally checking on Foxy or Freddy. It does involve a lot of listening, which you already know how I feel about, but personal problems aside, I do like the gameplay loop of this game, especially because it tries to keep this loop interesting by adding new things almost every night, with Foxy getting in on night 3 and a completely new character being introduced on the final night, Nightmare Fredbear. And the lore. Actually, can we get the entire lore of the FNAF games done now? Like right now? Okay, cool. <laughs> Just kidding, you fools! Do you really think I'm gonna put myself through all that? Absolutely not! I've witnessed people going insane from trying to figure out what this franchise's law means. I know this is supposed to be the video where I talk about everything FNAF, but this is one can of worms I'm not touching anymore since frankly I haven't understood the law for the past three years, and people who do understand it have explained it way better than I ever could. So instead of trying to actually explain the FNAF law myself, I recommend you go watch videos from some other creators who have already delved into this topic. After this FNAF 4 segment is done, I won't be explaining the overarching lore of the series anymore. I'll only mention it if I feel like it's necessary. Okay, back to FNAF 4 and its lore for real this time. The biggest flaw I think this game has is what implications to the lore it has. This game revolves around the crying child, a mysterious character who doesn't get much backstory except for the fact that he had some traumatic event happen in the past which caused him to become very scared of animatronics. He also has a brother who is a complete dickhead and coincidentally is also wearing a foxy mask. Through the interactive cutscenes in between the nights we get given one of the biggest lore reveals in all of NAF. Was that the bite of 87? No it's not, because actually this is the bite of 83. A date that really means fuck all currently and has never been brought up until this point. After this bite, the crying child assumedly went into a coma, considering you keep seeing hospital equipment appear behind you at various points of the game, and these are just your last moments having to fend off from the creatures that haunted you in the real world as well. It would be quite a sad story if it wasn't for the fact that this game is way too fucking vague. This game does the thing that I hate the most when it comes to stories in games. It answers no questions and just leaves you with more. FNAF 2 at least showed us how the robots are Possessed and the identity of the killer, and FNAF 3 I've talked about enough. But this game just throws in the most useless filler shit like the aforementioned part of 83 that at this point in the series didn't mean anything to anyone, and just felt like a random day to put what was obviously a gigantic part of the lore to happen at. The cutscenes don't tell us enough about anything and the game just adds in other random useless shit. We didn't need to know about this child, we didn't need to know about this other bite. All this information feels useless and from a lore perspective to this 
the 8th FNAF 4 is in a strange grey area and doesn't properly fit anywhere. And personally, I blame FNAF 4 for starting the downhill spiral that is the FNAF lore nowadays. I really hate the lore implications of this game and that's what makes this game kind of the opposite of FNAF 3. Its gameplay is really solid and as a game it's pretty great, but the lore just fucks it up for me so much. Whilst FNAF 3 has amazing lore implications, but is kind of a shit game. FNAF 4 is quite a divisive game. Some people love it and think it's the scariest FNAF game ever, and some think it's meaningless fluff that only messes up the lore of the games and is only scary because of the loud volume of the jump scares. I personally fall somewhere in between those two opinions. On the FNAF scale, trademark, I'd put it as a solid B. It's fine. I like FNAF 2 a bit better, but it's fine nonetheless. The release of FNAF 4, at least for a while, marked the end of Five Nights at Freddy's. Everyone thought this was it. FNAF was finally done. It ended on a pretty confusing note, but it ended nonetheless. But then Scott realized his love for RPGs, what? In early 2016, Scott took the strangest turn when it comes to the FNAF franchise and decided to make an RPG featuring chibi versions of the FNAF animatronics called FNAF World. This game came as a pretty big shock to everyone, yet everyone also forgot about this game two seconds after it came out, including me. I almost left this game out of this video entirely by accident until YouTube recommendations reminded me of this thing's existence, so I guess it's time to look at FNAF World. Also, before I get into this, I'm just gonna spoil my opinion about this game and say I don't like FNAF World at all, so expect some extra harshness from me. But for the not-so-civil people inevitably watching this, this is my opinion. And if you can enjoy this game, cool. I'm glad you could get enjoyment out of something, I thoroughly cannot. Anyway, back to the bullshit. When you first create a new game, you get introduced to the initial story of FNAF World, which revolves around its setting, Animatronica. The lands have become strange and infested by glitches that have mysteriously appeared inside the game. Yes, we're going this meta. And you need to go to a place called the flip side to find out what's really causing the game to break by finding glitches around the world and passing through them to find out the truth. The adventure starts... And would you look at that, this game looks bad. The game looks like a baby's first RPG. The environment just looks like an RPG Maker default preset with some 3D textures here and there. And speaking of that, there's a strange mix of 2D and 3D, with the worst offender being these houses that look so out of place and shit. The one thing I can give to this game when it comes to the visuals is that the characters look charming. I'm actually pretty impressed with how Scott managed to make the characters of FNAF into something cute, but other than that I think this game kinda looks like ass and kinda plays like ass too. Now I am not an avid fan of RPGs, so I knew I wasn't going to have the greatest time with this game considering from what I remembered, it had pretty generic RPG elements I don't enjoy like turn-based combat and grinding, so I did lower my expectations for this game to not be too harsh towards it. But even with my expectations lowered, I was not prepared for how nothing this gameplay is. All you do is walk around trying to find glitches in the map to advance the story and find Fredbear, who will, in turn, give you directions to the next place glitch you need to find. In the middle of this mindless walking, you stumble across random encounters, and whilst I was expecting these, they happen so frequently, and these generic turn-based battles can drag out for so long, since you can get stuck in a situation where you nor the enemies are doing anything, yet for another 40 fucking seconds, you can't make a single move, leading to the main gameplay of the game becoming really boring really fast. And the difficulty balancing of this game is also pretty uneven. You can go to an area and beat an enemy relatively easily, and then go to a different section of the same area where you get one shot instantly. I couldn't really plan for how difficult areas were gonna be, since it always felt random apart from the general rule of new area means harder enemies, which we're all used to by now. The gameplay of FNAF World just isn't fun, but that might just be me not liking RPGs. I also found myself getting stuck on what to do constantly, since the entire point is to find glitches, like textures you can clip through and whatnot, right? But how am I supposed to figure out that there is one specific block here that you need to pass through because yes, the game just expects you to bump into every block in every area so you may hopefully pop into some secret room. There are some glitches that are easier to see than others, but most of the time you have no indication as to what exactly you're looking for, so the gameplay turns into mindlessly bashing into every wall to hopefully find the right one and goddammit random encounters! And the sounds. 
actually pretty good. That's the one thing I can give this game. The sound design and music are good. I like the crunchy sound effects and the way old FNAF sounds have been implemented in, and the music bangs. So that's one good thing I can say. But mostly FNAF World feels really unpolished, which is my main problem with it. It feels like the beta of a fan game that could be really good if given a few more years, but instead it is an official game made by the creator of FNAF that cost actual human money at some point. I initially just wanted to get through one of the endings for this video because I looked up how long it would take to fully complete the game and... <laughs> 40 hours! I'm not putting myself through that pain, so I just opted to beat the main story of the game. But lo and behold... Hi. Apologies for the shitty mic quality, I do not have the time to actually plug my good microphone in. It is 1am currently. I have gone every single button that is required to open this. Sorry, I'm not in the game. To open this. God. I watched a few tutorials, I think I've done everything I need to do to open this gate, but it is not open. The game has glitched out on me. I cannot finish the game now, but to be honest, for a game involving rock glitches and everything breaking, it's quite a fitting end. I'm not playing this game anymore. Funnily enough, the game about finding glitches ended on a real glitch that stopped the game from working. Now, I can respect Scott for trying something new, and having the courage to go through with something completely different to what he was known for, but the game just fails to be interesting or fun to me in any way, shape or form. It's just really messy and unpolished, with boring gameplay, kinda bad visuals, and nothing to keep me playing. Many people seem to love this game online though, and I can see why. It does have a certain vibe to it, and if you actually like RPGs, you can probably excuse the problems this game has, but it's not for me. On the FNAF scale, trademark, I'd put it on the D tier. FNAF World is a strange addition to the franchise that seemed to please many, but disappoint an equal amount of people as well. Everyone collectively forgot about this game after a while, and so FNAF was finally done, even though it ended on a slightly more sour note. But then... So Scott still wasn't done with the FNAF games. Whether it was because he felt like the law got too jumbled up with FNAF War and wanted to correct it, or if he just likes money and attention, I don't know. But nevertheless, a new game called Five Nights at Freddy's Sister Location was released on October 7th, 2016. A whole year and four months after FNAF 4, which at the time was the longest wait time for any FNAF game. This game had a premise even stranger to FNAF 4, with you playing as a maintenance worker at an underground distribution center for the now unused animatronics of Circus Baby's Pizza World, another Freddy's type location in this universe. Your main job is to maintain the facility itself and the robots inside of it. This is the point where I'd usually explain how the gameplay loop of this game works, if it wasn't for the fact that this game changes up the gameplay for each night, having you do various different tasks all around the facility. During night one, you get introduced to the Handy Unit, an AI who will be talking to you throughout the entire game and works as this game's phone guy. After descending to the facility via elevator that's older than your mum, you are shown the various tasks you're supposed to complete each night. You have to check on three animatronics, Ballora, Funtime Foxy, the dickhead, and Circus Baby to make sure they still function. If they're not on their respective stages, you can use some relaxing shock therapy to get them back to their places. Once you've checked for each animatronic, seen that baby didn't appear on her stage but the computer says it's all okay so whatever, you get to go home and enjoy an episode of your favorite soap opera. This night is mostly here to sell the premise, with nothing particularly scary happening for the entire night apart from a few noises that lead nowhere. During night 2, shit gets more interesting, with you going through the same tasks as on night 1, but when you get to Circus baby's auditorium, she's nowhere to be seen. You try the classic shock therapy on her, but end up breaking the shocking machinery of the place and whatnot, causing Handy Unit to temporarily cut all power in the facility to fix the issue. After this, baby starts fucking talking and advises you to get underneath the desk in front of you to hide from these miniature babies that also exist in this facility now. After avoiding death from these things by 
Holding a door closed, BB advises you to not trust Handy Unit anymore. The unit then comes back online and tells you that you'll have to restore some of the facility's power manually in another room, but to get to that room you have to go through Ballora Gallery. You get through the gallery, trying not to make noise and disturb this thing, and you end up in a room face to face with Funtime Freddy, another new character. You restore the power and keep away Funtime Freddy by activating his remote controlled therapist every once in a while, go back through Ballora Gallery and make it back home somehow safely. On night 3 you have to fix Funtime Freddy, but to get to him you have to get through Funtime Foxy's auditorium, which requires you to cross its room with a flashlight beacon to see if Funtime Foxy is in front of you. After getting through the gallery you start fixing up Freddy and everything's going great until this fucker decides to start moving. You catch the thing, finish up your work and start heading back through the Funtime gallery only to be greeted by this friendly face. The next thing you know, you've been kidnapped by Baby, and the next night begins. So night 4 takes place inside the spring lock suit, which Baby put you in to hide you from the other animatronics to protect you, I guess. But unfortunately, the suit starts to slowly get filled by these marionette looking things, and from this point onward, the whole night is just a constant battle for survival as you wind up the spring locks for the suit, but also try to wiggle off the two singular minarinas trying to get to you. There is this massive army of minarinas marching inside your suit, but apparently they don't matter so oh well. If you manage to survive this entire ordeal you are able to get out of the suit and go home. And during night 5 you must go fix Circus Baby and whilst fixing her you get told by Baby that Ballora is apparently now more pissed off than ever and is coming for you. I guess she managed to break her copy of Darren's dance grooves and now has nothing to do. So with the help of Baby's instructions you are supposed to get through the Funtime Auditorium safely but instead arrive in a room with a machine called the Scooper that works in a similar way to a nice Scream scoop but instead it scoops your innards. In fact that's exactly what's happened here since it turns out the voice you've been hearing the entire time isn't baby but this new animatronic that's an amalgamation of all the animatronics combined called Ennard. Basically all Ennard and the voices in his head want to do is get out into the real world to live a normal life so they decide to scoop out your insides and climb inside your skin to go into the outside world and so the game ends. 12 plus rating everyone, I'm gonna say it now, this is one of my favorite FNAF games. The thing I love about it the most is its variety in gameplay. Now you could argue that this is what makes this location lose some of what makes FNAF FNAF since it doesn't really have the whole thing of getting introduced to a relatively complex set of mechanics that you have to learn and get better at throughout the five nights to beat the game. But I don't see that as a problem this far into the franchise. We've been through the same five fucking nights enough times by now and a change in gameplay every night just felt like the right thing to do at this point in the franchise. It holds that fear of the unknown for so much longer than any other FNAF game since you don't know what to expect. In the other games you know what's gonna happen after night 3 and it becomes infinitely less scary because of that. But in this location all the nights have completely different things happening in them to keep that scary factor alive the whole way through, at least on your first playthrough. Another thing I'd like to point out is the fact that this game feels like it could work as a game on its own and I'll explain what that means. With all the games excluding the original, they always felt like continuations for something bigger, and it always felt, at least to me, that you couldn't get much enjoyment out of these games if you weren't aware of everything that had happened in the previous ones. But due to the fact that this location has a mini story of its own and new ways of storytelling compared to the other FNAF games, it has become an adventure of its own that could work as its own game and a continuation of the FNAF franchise. It's just so unique whilst still keeping the original feeling of FNAF intact and I love that. Now I am very well aware that this game has some major issues. For example, this game has absolutely no replayability. After you've gone through the initial adventure that was your first playthrough, nothing changes if you decide to play it again and that is a shame. Also the minigames can feel a bit frustrating at times since they aren't really built on top of each other. It would have been cool to see the mechanics of at least some of the minigames mixed together, but instead the game puts you in a mindset where most of the shit you learn to do during this game probably won't affect the future, and therefore you forget about the mechanics really quickly. It should also be said that I can completely understand how some people would get frustrated by how different this game is compared to the other games, since it does stray very far away from what FNAF is at its core. You're here to play FNAF, not Detroit become skin suit for metal spaghetti. I get it, but personally I love the direction this game took. 
A lot of people didn't love this direction though, and wanted something more akin to the original FNAF style of gameplay, but thankfully there is something hidden inside this game for those people, the secret Ennard fight. So in the extras menu of the game you get a blueprint for the whole map of the game, which includes a strange room you were never allowed in before, and is coincidentally on the opposite side of the scooping room. So during the part where Baby instructs you on how to get to the scooping room, if you go right every time she tells you to go left, you can actually find this room room for yourself, but unfortunately at this point only death awaits since the secret death minigame hasn't been completed. Long story short, there's a minigame that happens occasionally when you die and if you beat it in a specific way you get another one of those cutscenes that reveal something assumedly important, and it also gives you access to the secret room, where you can start your fight with Enid. Here, you go face to face with this bin, and have to use your cameras to track down where he is and close the corresponding door when the right audio cue is played. It's a relatively fun and cool secret boss fight, if a bit bullshitty when it comes to how fast the power drains, that incorporates the classic FNAF formula into the game so the game doesn't feel like a new product completely unrelated to the original four games. It's nice, it gives you an alternate ending that still assumedly leads to the same outcome as the original ending, and I knew I had to mention it somewhere here, so... here. Anyway, in general, I really like this location for how unique it felt from the rest, and how it manages to feel like a great standalone game on top of being a good addition to the main franchise, although I will admit it's got some major issues. On the FNAF scale, trademark, I'd put it in the A tier, slightly above FNAF 2 and FNAF 4. Okay, I'm tired of doing the bit now, the games continue on for various reasons even after this point, so let's just cut to the chase and talk about... So after the release of this location, Scott went completely silent for another year, giving people the slightest glimmer of hope that maybe, just maybe, we could be finally done with the series and that there would be no more FNAF games out there. On December 4th, 2017, Scott dropped this tiny game called Freddy Fazbear's Pizzeria Simulator, a simple pixel art game with very minimal gameplay and nearly no hype built around it since teasers for this thing started appearing only a few months before the game's release. Unlike the other games, where the teasers were absolutely constant basically since the start of production. The game begins and you play as Freddy, giving pizzas to children. You do this for like a minute until... oh. Oh. I'm not actually surprised, but you know, tension. So yeah, what was essentially viewed as this tiny throwaway game turned out to be the next mainline installation to the FNAF series. FNAF 6, which is apparently not the official name for the game even though it is the 6th official game in the series, the official name is Pizzeria Simulator, but fuck off, it's FNAF 6 and that's what I'll keep calling it, has you start up your very own Freddy's restaurant with the help of Fazbear Entertainment. After this strange opening, the game becomes this pizzeria tycoon type of game where you build your very own pizzeria from the ground up, adding in animatronics and games galore. The more things you have in your pizzeria, the more likely your business is to succeed. But this harmless tycoon section is just the first of three separate gameplay phases of FNAF 6, the second of which being where the actual FNAF parts of the game lie, the office phase. The office phase has you doing the boring parts of business, printing out flyers, ordering supplies, general advertising, all the monotonous stuff. Who knew that the true horror of NAF was the stresses of entrepreneurship all along? And all of this is done by a your trusty computer that's as slow as my brain during any situations where I'm under stress. Your main goal during this phase is to finish all of your tasks and log off, after which you can leave. But as this is a FNAF game, you're not alone in here. You see, during this section, your actions from the pizzeria phase affect your survivability here. There are some items that you can buy during the pizzeria phase that have a liability risk, meaning they are usually much lower in price, but also have a chance of carrying something unusual inside side of them. Buying things with a liability risk increases your general risk factor, and all you need to know about the risk factor is if it's higher than 1, it means that most likely an animatronic has made its way into your building. Because I guess somehow this fucking thing managed to hide in there and get in undetected. Also you can accept sponsorships from companies wanting to sponsor your pizzeria, but taking these offers makes your PC blast their ads out at random, pausing your work briefly and making things generally harder for you. So the more safely you play in the pizzeria phase, the safer you'll be in the office phase. 
But back to the phase itself, there are two massive vents on either side of you, and that's where all the animatronics dwell. They'll find their way to you by the sounds you make, and the things that make sound in your office, apart from you going into cardiac arrest, are the computer actually doing your tasks, and the ventilation system that keeps the room from overheating. You have the ability to shut down these two noisemakers, but the downsides to shutting your equipment down is that your computer, surprisingly enough, doesn't work if you turn it off, so no work actually gets done if you shut it off. And turning off the ventilation system makes the room so hot that in Fahrenheit you'd pass out and in Celsius you'd get the classic Finnish sauna experience. So it's a game of giving and taking. Shutting down the systems makes it so that the animatronics are way less likely to get to you, but you'll lose either your progress or the ability to live if you turn these things off for long enough. But even if you make as little noise as you can, the robots will inevitably get to you. But you do have a few more tools that you can use to deter them. Firstly, on your computer, you have a motion detector, so you can see where exactly the animatronics are at and predict their moves. An audio law to law animatronics to specific location SNAF3 style, and a silent ventilation that basically just does fuck all since it lowers the animatronics awareness, which you can do anyway by turning off the actual ventilation for a brief second. And sometimes the robots get a tad bit too close to you despite all the tools you have. So what do you do in this situation? You shine a light down a vent to prevent the robots from coming in and shut the fuck up. So the game becomes another act of balancing tasks and defenses to get through your tasks as fast as possible. I do quite like the ideas that were put into this phase, because the task-based nights are way more stressful since it's not just about survival. You have to actively do shit throughout the entire night until you leave. It upholds the stress levels for far longer and makes it so every night feels at least a little bit stressful despite the gameplay loop being the same every night. Also, there's no guarantee that a certain animatronic will come out of a certain vent, and no character has a particularly specific pattern to their movements, making each night and each playthrough slightly different, since you can't stick to a singular foolproof tactic and repeat it over and over to win even the hardest modes. But whilst the ideas it throws at you are great, the execution is quite lacking, since even though the game introduces you to a lot of different things to defend yourself with, 90% of the office phase gameplay consists of you looking at a vent and doing nothing. Genuinely, you look through the motion detector for what side a robot is more likely to attack from, put an audio law near the robot to hopefully lure it away, start a task, and then look at this stupid fucking vent for 5 minutes. Rinse and repeat until all the tasks are done. It just becomes really boring after a while, and yet again, there are listening mechanics which I have a very hard time with, making this game not fun to beat for me. It has a ton of great ideas, but the ideas aren't integrated to the gameplay in a fun way, because most of your time, again, is spent doing fuck all looking at a wall. And then, there's the salvage phase. So after each office phase, you get placed in an interrogation room of sorts, where a mysterious voice tells you that part of your job requires you to take care of these animatronics that have suddenly appeared in the back alley of your pizzeria. You can either proceed to salvage these animatronics to gain a hefty chunk of money, or throw them back into the alley if you don't want this thing inside your restaurant, and to be honest, I can't blame you. We're here to have things happen, so you go along with the salvage, listening to different audio cues trying to see if the animatronic of the day responds to it or not, and write the reactions down on your checklist. The animatronics never move during the audio prompts themselves, but they almost always move when you have the paper in front of your face. The animatronics have three phases of movement. By the third movement, you are screwed unless you use the company given taser to calm these robots down, although after a few zaps, the animatronic starts losing its value. A jump scare or a completed salvage later, congratulations, you've officially made the game way harder for yourself for seemingly no reason. Each night includes all of these three phases, and your actions completely decide the difficulty of the game. Buy nothing with a liability risk and salvage no one, and you'll be able to get through the game without any challenge. And on the other hand, being super risky and salvaging everything allows you to make your pizzeria the best it can be, but makes the office phase way harder. So as you can see, just like this location, this game changed things up a lot. There's a nice contrast between the happy pizzeria phase, the stressful office phase, and the intimidating salvage phase, and it all becomes a surprisingly balanced experience of not scary and scary. But whilst I do think this game 
balances itself very well, I also think everything in it could have been done much better. Firstly, the pizzeria phase is underwhelming. You have a bunch of things to buy, and if you make enough deals with the devil, you should have enough money to buy most of said things. But there's just not much to do after buying shit. You can see whatever you bought in the pizzeria and play a few okay minigames, but nothing really exciting. Obviously, this is only one part of the game, and making a super complicated pizzeria tycoon wasn't Scott's main plan, but the game is called Freddy Fazbear's Pizzeria Simulator, so the fact that the game's namesake phase is basically nothing is kinda disappointing. Then there's the office phase, which I think is stressful and scary, but not fun. I already talked about my main issues with this phase, so let me keep this short. There's way too much downtime where you do absolutely nothing, hearing based mechanics make games so much harder for me to play, it becomes so boring so fast while still staying stressful because of the task mechanic, and so it makes you yawn and shit your pants at the same time, which is a feeling I'd rather not have again, and as a new bit of negativity, I don't like how you can't see any of the animatronics except if you die, giving this phase an even lesser feeling of anything happening. The salvage sections are cool though. They're intimidating and a cool way of introducing the animatronics you'll be up against. The only complaint I have about them is that an animatronic can randomly attack you at any moment during the salvage, and the only indication of this attack are the unique about to attack sounds each robot has, and if this sound happens, you are seconds away from death. The game doesn't tell you this or indicate it in any way and a lot of people just thought it was a glitch, and when a game mechanic feels and seems like a glitch, that's not a good thing. But I do have to cut the game some slack, since it wasn't made with gameplay hugely in mind. Instead, this game was made purely to finish the story of the games. Oh, Mao. I'm not getting into the overarching lore of the games anymore, but basically throughout FNAF 4 and this location, the story had grown a lot, but had gotten to a point where it could be finished in a satisfying way again. And through the various easter eggs, minigames, and multiple endings of FNAF 6, we learn about the details of some of the biggest questions of FNAF, and through the complete ending get another fantastic way to cap off the story of this game and get one of the coolest ending speeches I've seen. If you know, you know. I still stand by the fact that the game should have ended at 3, but I'm also quite happy about the fact that we were able to get this ending. On the FNAF scale, trademark, I give FNAF 6 a high C. With the ideas of the game and its phases being great, and the story reveals of the game being good, because for once they gave us some fucking answers, but the execution of the previously mentioned ideas was really lackluster, and as a game, not thinking about its lore implications, it kinda falls flat. I know the game wasn't made to be a groundbreaking masterpiece of gameplay, but I am judging it as a game as well, and it's just not very good. Oh yeah, also this game is completely completely free, so it gets a bunch of extra points for that. But hey, at least that final speech was cool as hell. Speaking of hell... One of the most popular parts of all the FNAF games that I've failed to mention in detail so far has been the Custom Night mode, a mode that allows you to customize your own night by letting you change the AI levels of all animatronics in a given game. This can be used to explore the mechanics of a single animatronic a bit more by looking at its behavior on certain AI levels, or by making you hate yourself by putting everyone on max difficulty trying to survive the night for longer than 2.58 milliseconds. And so far, almost every game has had something like this, except FNAF 3 and 4 which just had challenges, and the custom nights grew bigger and harder as the years went by, with the custom night of Sist location being so big that it was basically its own game with its own mechanics and new characters. And FNAF 6 got the same custom night treatment as Sist location, but taken to an extreme, with FNAF 6 getting a custom night that wasn't just a part of the base game or even added DLC, but a whole ass other game called Ultimate Custom Night that combined characters from each game giving it a sizable roster of 50 fucking characters. Ultimate Custom Night is a game that works probably exactly as you think. You have these 50 animatronics, all with varying mechanics and difficulties. You can activate any combination of animatronics and set their AI to anything between 0 and 20, and see what happens. There is really no proper goal to this game, if you want to play casually, that is. You get to make your own custom night and have fun with whatever characters you want to play against or experiment with, and it's a pretty damn fun and cool send-off to the franchise, going out with the most customizable experience in all of FNAF. Yeah, the jump scares were some of the worst the series had to offer, and it can be pretty overwhelming trying to learn the ins and outs of the controls and characters at the beginning, but once you get the hang of it all, the game becomes a real fun experience. But that shit's lame. 
casual, non-radical. If you feel competitive, you could always try the hardest settings of this game, which is basically anything above 4020 mode, where you have 40 whole animatronics at max AI against you all at once. It might sound impossible from a glance, but it's actually really surprising just how balanced every character seems to be with each other. And I don't know if it's because I got used to the other chaos of this game because I played this game so much, but even at these higher difficulties, the game doesn't feel that chaotic because the balancing between all the mechanics of the various characters is really solid. You might be wondering if there was an actual incentive as to why someone should even attempt to get through the harder difficulties of this game, and frankly enough, there actually were some incentives back in the day. So there were these goofy ass anime cutscenes that you'd get if you were able to beat some of the harder challenges of the games. That, of course, gave hints to the secrets of the lore of this and previous games. But on top of these lore reveals, there was a grand prize that initially awaited you if you were able to get through the hardest official FNAF challenge ever, 5020 mode. The final and hardest challenge of the game is 5020 mode, where all 50 characters are set to the highest difficulty and you somehow have to survive it all for four and a half minutes. This game mode requires a shit ton of tactics, reaction speeds, and luck and incorporates a lot of things you'd probably have learned from the previous FNAF games, like being able to take information from very brief glances at the cameras and being able to listen for sound cues instead of looking for visual ones. Initially, people thought this challenge was impossible, and so did Scott. He was so sure that people couldn't beat it that he was willing to publicly congratulate the first 10 winners of 5020 mode. And a race on who could beat that mode and get to that top 10 started and quickly became very stressful yet rewarding for some. I should know, since I was almost one of those top 10 people. I should probably mention that at some point, huh? So if you haven't been here since 2018, which I hope you haven't, I started out on this channel by playing Ultimate Custom Night. Hello everyone, and welcome back to Five Nights at Freddy's Ultimate Custom Night. Ignore him. I realized I was actually pretty good at this game after beating 4520 mode with relative ease and wanted to show my further accomplishments to the world. So I started uploading videos beating the various modes and those videos got a fair bit of traction as well. Those videos actually got more views than any of the videos I've made during this year that are actually good. <laughs> I'm not salty in the slightest piss off. And as much as it pains me to say, FNAF officially started my time uploading on YouTube. YouTube, and because of that, this game has a special place in my heart. I got pretty damn close to beating 5020 mode as well. I got to 5am on multiple occasions and was well on my way to top 10. But then, I very abruptly stopped. I quit. For seemingly no reason in retrospect. Looking back at it, I had wasted a ton of time on this game and had gotten to the point where I had nearly perfected the strategy itself and it was all down to luck at this point. And I guess having wasted my entire vacation sweating inside my room because of NAF, Shit. I just didn't want to waste even more time just to maybe never accomplish it due to luck, so I never beat it. I'm actually pretty disappointed at myself for not completing the challenge, since I had spent that entire time grinding out the game and just gave up at the end and threw all that time I'd spent on the game into the waste. But over the years that taste has worn off, considering this is a FNAF game and shouldn't be taken that seriously. Personal grudges and feelings aside, the fact that Scott managed to make it so balanced with all the characters and also managed to get this game out in just a few months is definitely admirable. But that inarguably rushed production makes it so this game doesn't feel very polished around the visual or sound department. But this game, just like FNAF 6, is free so that, combined with how little this game took to create, does give the game a lot of extra points. On the FNAF scale, trademark, I'd give UCN a low B under FNAF 2 and 4 since it's objectively not the greatest or most polished game but I think it's more fun than the games below it, even if it's worse quality-wise. And then came silence. For about another year until the best game in the franchise was released, god damn it, let me rest! Wait, what did you say about the best game in the franchise?
So a thing people have been saying about this franchise for years is that FNAF would be amazing in virtual reality. Most of the games are already set in one singular space that you don't move in much, making it easy to transform those games into VR experiences that could be legitimately scary. Scott realized the potential of this VR idea too and decided to create an official FNAF VR game, and for the first time ever partnered up with another company, Steel World Studios, to make it a reality. And so, on May 28, 2019, Five Nights at Freddy's VR Help Wanted was released. And it's the best FNAF game there is. This game is essentially a collection of minigames, ranging from original games that have been remade to VR to completely original minigames meant for the virtual reality experience. In this game, you get every game from the original trilogy remade for VR, four nights of FNAF 4 with differing animatronics to change up the formula, parts and service, which just has you doing maintenance work on the original four animatronics, then Repair, which is just claustrophobia incarnate, and Dark Rooms, which includes the fun with plush trap and balloon boy minigames, these shits, and the Funtime Auditorium Hall Crawl from FNAF says the location. There is so much more content here than most people thought there'd be, and even though they had seven whole games' worth of content to take from, they managed to pick the most VR friendly yet scary parts of each game for this game, and they all work wonderfully. This game is so goddamn immersive and terrifying, and even though most of the game is just you playing through the same things you've most likely played through in the past, the fact that it's in VR makes it all feel like a fresh and scary experience. When I first bought this game, I got a few friends of mine to come around and test the game out with me, and we recorded the whole thing. So to further demonstrate just how scary this game is in VR, I'm gonna show you some highlights from our play session. The clips are almost completely in Finnish, but I've subtitled them for you. Okay. <laughs> oh god, oh no 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 no. Uh, fuck. Press buttons, survive until 6 am. Simple. Uh, no! No! Hey, Dad, I'm going to be too Hello. Jesus! Hey, Satana! Hi. Now, I want Kamala. Oh my god, oh my god, oh my god, oh my god. Where the f? Ooh. Ooh, so I'm I'm going back into the gaming world, but oh my! Oh no 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 man! I think it's <laughs> scary as fuck. It's a tad bit scary. This is probably the scariest game in the franchise, purely from the VR aspect, but it's also fun as fuck. All the minigames are great and have been optimized for VR really well, making you want to go back in despite the terrifying factor. Now it does have some issues, like the non-VR version not being worth the money at all since it's just a worse version of the already existing games, and also this game had to stuff in some unnecessary lore that made everything way more confusing and stupid and I don't like it. We could've just let the lore die out and have this be a fun collection of mini games, but alas, useless lore had to be thrown in for good measure. But even with those minuscule flaws on the FNAF scale trademark, I'm gonna give FNAF VR an S rank. It is simply the best FNAF game there is. And so every single genre of game had been explored with FNAF, point and click games and VR games. The only two genres. But now with the floodgates having been opened for more FNAF games by the lore implications of FNAF VR, people needed to figure out a way to keep their franchise rolling, until someone over at Illumix looked at their phone and said, Oh my god. Mobile games, am I right? Candy Crush, Angry Bird, Little Plus, I don't really play mobile games. I don't think anyone over the age of 10 and under the age of 40 has enjoyed mobile games in a while. Most of them are just cash grabs with very minimal gameplay that are meant to just entice you to purchase in-game currency. But even though a lot of people don't really play mobile games anymore, every single franchise on this planet seemingly has one, knockoff or original, and FNAF is no exception. On November 25th, 2019, FNAF AR Special Delivery was released to the world by Illumix, and is an augmented reality game similar to Pokemon Go, or... Moomin Moo. But instead of forcing you to go outside, thank god, it brings animatronics into your house via AR. I was fairly interested in this game when it came out, and wanted to see if it was actually a good game and not a generic cash grab, but during the time of release I didn't have a phone new enough to play the game. But I've updated my cellular device since then, and for this video managed to capture my first reactions to the game.
Okay, this is the first time I'm ever opening up FNAF AR. Let's see what the fuck is up. I haven't seen almost anything about this game, so we'll see what happens. Important notice, I accept everything. Hey, uh, so... The the part mm, good. <laughs> I to be completely honest with you, I don't think this section was funny like at all, and also the audio was kind of shit. So uh, to save you from this quote unquote highlight reel, let's just skip right to the ending verdict. Okay, so FNAF AR, my verdict is a bit boring, and uh, uh, I'm fucking dying now. I guess, but. Yeah, I didn't really enjoy my time with the game, but it is a mobile game, so my expectations were low to begin with. It was just kind of nothing. The most okay mobile game I've played in forever. And on the FNAF scale, trademark, it goes on the D tier. It's not very good. Now with that done and over with, we've arrived at the last game in the series currently, which is also the most controversial game of them all. Only a few months before FNAF AR, Scott released a picture onto his website scottgames.com of a strange mall location seemingly from the 80s, with a version of Freddy we had never seen before called Glamrock Freddy. Yada yada yada, after a bunch of teasers for a new game, Scott revealed Five Nights at Freddy's security breach to the world. This was going to be the biggest FNAF game ever, with a team of over 30 people working on the game, and it being released as a PS1 launch title alongside games like Resident Evil? What? Also, this game was the first game mostly being made without Scott Cawthon, considering this was the point at which he retired from FNAF, so Security Breach was being made almost entirely by Steel Wool. Needless to say, this was a big deal. A truly mainstream FNAF game, with a whole studio behind it and a secured place in the spotlight thanks to the PS5. This massive game was set to be released on November 12th, 2020, alongside the PS5. But it wasn't, since the game was a bit too ambitious to be completed in such a short period of time and a whole year of delays later, on December 16th, 2021, Five Nights at Freddy's Security Breach was released. And it's awful. Disclaimer. Cyperior heavily dislikes security breach so expect some harshness yet again and don't get too worked up over his or your own opinions about the game. The story of Security Breach revolves around the Pizzaplex, a giant mall themed entirely around Freddy's, where their new cast of this game, the Glamrock animatronics, perform. One day Glamrock Freddy suffers a malfunction on stage for some reason, and after being escorted to his own room finds a strange child named Gregory inside him for some reason. Gregory climbs out and explains that he's on the run from the security guard Vanessa for some reason, and Freddy decides to help Gregory get out of the Pizzaplex before closing time without Vanessa seeing him, and he needs to get Gregory out fast since the other animatronics are evil for some reason. But oh no, the doors have closed and won't open until 6am, so Gregory needs to do some random bullshit for 6 hours until the doors open up again for some reason. So uh, immediately I have no clue what's happening. There is a difference between being vague about the story of a game and not telling the player enough to understand what they're playing. You can be really vague about the universe of a game, like for example with FNAF 1, but you have to give a premise better than this shit. In FNAF 1 it's simple, you are a security guard at Freddy's who's initially unaware of the fact that the robots are haunted and after you find out the truth start fending off against them. Yeah, it doesn't make sense why you'd go back there for the entire week, but you can at least sort of excuse that with something like curiosity. There is a premise to go off of that you can connect future events to. But Security Breach just doesn't give you anything. There is no setup at the beginning. And this would be fine, many games like to throw you in the middle of a confusing situation only to explain things later, but Security Breach never explains anything. You never find out why Gregory is in the Pizzaplex, why Freddy is nice whilst everyone else is a killer, why the robots are killers in the first place, why the tech is suddenly so advanced that the robots are basically just people, why Gregory doesn't trust Vanessa, dot dot dot, etc. It feels like the developers cut out either something from the beginning or the end that was supposed to explain why you're in the situation you're in, but nothing ever gets explained, making the beginning of the game feel extremely confusing. Already this game is showing that it doesn't have great storytelling, and spoilers, it doesn't get any better from here. There's no explanation for why you do anything, and all attempts at emotional beats fail because usually they come out of 
nowhere and lead nowhere. This feels like a game with no story, and that would be fine if it wasn't for the fact that this was clearly supposed to be a game revolving around a big story because of the amount of characters, talking, and world building there is. I bet if a person who didn't know about FNAF played this game, which there probably were a few considering the hype this game got during the PS5 launch title scheme, they would not understand what the fuck is going on at any point of the game. FNAF fans can at least assume things based on the previous games, but for a newcomer to the series, this game doesn't explain fucking anything and would leave them unsatisfied and confused, especially considering the awful endings, but I'll get to them when the time is right. Confusing story aside, how's the gameplay like? This is the first time an official FNAF game has been truly free roam. Some of the previous games have had multiple places you can go to, but this takes it to a whole other level with a massive mall you get to explore to your heart's content. And what kind of gameplay do you get given in an environment as cool as this? One gigantic fetch quest. Now fair enough, a fetch quest or two makes sense for a game with an area of this size, but the entire game is just Gregory, go here. Then you stealth your way there only to either push a singular button, take a thing or just have nothing happen. Then you get told to go to another place where you do the same thing and it just loops for about seven hours. And the game itself is just a fucking walking simulator. Whilst going to places Freddy tells you to go to, you're supposed to do stealth and avoid these security bots that can call over the animatronics that can actually kill you. But the range of these things is so long sometimes it feels like I can't even walk by them and they still get me. And here's the kicker, if they catch you, they just teleport the nearest proper animatronic right behind you, making strategizing nearly useless. It's not like a situation where you can get caught and have a few moments to go hide somewhere because the things that can make you game over aren't here yet, instead you just have to start running and hope the shitty AI forgets about you after crouching for two seconds, which by the way is exactly how I got away from most of these encounters, the AI is terrible. This game is like those parodies of stealth games where crouching for two seconds makes the enemy forget about you. I never hid in a single one of the game's hiding spots, since I knew if I got caught I could just run behind a tiny obstacle, crouch for two seconds and they'd completely forget about me. There is no proper gameplay in the middle of these tiny missions, and very little incentive to explore the pizza plex, considering the security bots are everywhere and getting caught just once could mean an instant death. Also, the save stations of this game are very few and far between, so that instant death could mean having to play through an entire mission again just to get to where you were, making you even less likely to explore. It just makes you want to get to your objective without looking deeper into anything, aka walking monotonously, doing fuck all until you get to the thing you need to do. Obviously, you have some larger goals in this game, like taking care of the three other animatronics that manage to be the least scary things I've seen in any FNAF game considering they just look like marketing incarnate and also talk and have personalities, like regular people. This shit isn't scary. I already didn't like that the animatronics talked in sister location, which is something I think I forgot to mention, because it's just so much less scary if you give something that's supposed to be a mysterious ruthless killing machine a personality. And in this game, it's so much worse, because the designs aren't even scary, it just feels like you're running away from four people who'll scold you for running backstage. Doesn't feel like they're gonna kill me. Anyway, yeah, you're supposed to kill all these fuckos to upgrade Freddy in one of the only cool features in this game, which is that Freddy follows you around throughout the whole game as your companion. You also have to take care of Vanny, the main antagonist of this game who has about 10 minutes of total screen time in the game and doesn't feel at all important, or like a threat but you gotta take care of her because reasons, so that's another thing you gotta do. But neither of these things feel impactful or important because a lot of emphasis gets put on these characters, but the game gives you nothing to make you care about any of them. So yet again, the main gameplay of the game starts feeling like you are wasting your time. So the gameplay and story of Security Breach are bad and end up creating a very boring game. But what takes this game from boring to almost insulting are the bugs. Jumping on tables makes animatronics instantly forget about you. You can trap the moon into a constant state of cleaning up, making his boss fight pathetically easy. Voice lines frequently get placed on top of another because there are too many talks happening at the same time. The animatronics can get stuck in really dumb places. The cleaning bots' FPS is lower than any other robots for some reason. I could go on, but you get the point. There's so many of them! 
I don't understand how they could have let this many bugs exist in the game, and by the way, all these glitches still exist in the game despite it being almost a year old with two gigantic patches that have come out during this time. It is pretty insulting just how buggy of a game this is, and to add to that are the optimization issues. Even with the lowest graphics possible, it took me usually about 10 seconds to either load in a new area or go back to an area I just came out of. And I'm playing this shit on a computer that can handle almost any game I throw at it, so the fact that on the lowest settings this game barely manages to function is not a good look. And you know what the worst thing is? Steel Wall have officially confirmed that they are happy with the state of security breach and will not be making any major patches to focus on making the free DLC that'll be out next year. You have made a barely playable game, and after almost a year of fixing the most minute things, you decide to just leave it there? I started writing this part of the video before this announcement. I was going to have an entire rant about how I hate the mentality of give me a barely functioning game now and fix the bugs and patches later, since it sets the bar of quality for a new release so low. But I feel like that rant would be wasted on this game now that it's not gonna get updated much anymore. I... <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, so I started to sound genuinely angry there. Um, it's FNAF, I don't give a fuck. I just want to say most of my anger and the way I've written this script, even though I agree with every point I've made in this script, um, I have made it extra angry for comedic purposes and to make the complaining at least sound somewhat fun. Um, but I genuinely started to get kind of angry feelings there, which is like, it's FNAF, no need to get emotional over this shit, man. <laughs> so yeah, just so you know, the anger is like, it's, it's played up. I, I play up the anger. I'm not actually that pissed at this. It's just for comedic effect. Obviously, this is not entirely Steel Wolf's fault. There were many fans pestering them to release the game as fast as they could, leaving them with very little time to fix these things. But still, this game barely works, and to call this a product you're satisfied with, and want consumers to be satisfied with, is just something I can't agree on. So there's a shit ton of bugs, very poor optimization, boring gameplay, disconnected story that feels like pieces of the thing we were actually supposed to get, but how does it end? Is it any good? Enough to forgive everything else in this game? All the endings are bad. Yep, there's six whole endings in this one, and they all feel so unbelievably disconnected from anything you were doing during the game itself. So at the end of the game, the clock hits 6 a.m. The doors have opened and you get a choice to either leave the Pizzaplex, go deal with Vanny, or stay in the Pizzaplex to figure out what's truly going on, since, after all, the disappearances have not been dealt with yet. I'm sorry, did you not understand where the disappearances part came in? Well, me neither, because this is the only time it gets brought up in the entire fucking game. Anyway, yeah, that seemingly important line also just doesn't matter at all, since these endings have almost nothing to do with most of the things you did in the game. One of the strangest things about these endings is the fact that, apart from like two endings, all of them have been made in this weird comic book style that appears nowhere else in the game. And I think this is one of the clearest signs of the people working on this game not having enough time to finish it, including these cutscenes. All of these endings feel like they're supposed to be really impactful, like the one where Freddy burns the whole pizza plex down despite him fully well knowing all his friends are alive and inside there, and in a previous cutscene he said that he'd never hurt his friends, but here we are burning them down anyway. Or the one where Gregory, Vanessa the security guard, and Freddy's head sit on top of a hill eating ice cream, despite the fact that Vanessa was supposed to be someone Gregory doesn't trust, and also Freddy wasn't supposed to be able to exist outside the pizza plex due to the immense amounts of power it takes for him to stay alive, but apparently his head can survive just fine. And no, I hate continuity too. Major plot holes aside, these endings are supposed to feel impactful, as I said, but relate in no way to what you were doing in the game itself, and don't feel deserved, satisfying, or even cohesive. But okay, these endings are assumedly not canon, since there is one ending that feels very clearly like the canon ending. And too bad, it's like one of the worst ones out of the bunch. The true ending of NAF Security Breach has you going deep down below the Pizzaplex with a fully upgraded Freddy. With this absolute beast of an animatronic, you find an old abandoned Freddy Fazbear's that you can explore for like two minutes until you realize there is almost nothing of substance in there. You head even deeper into the building, Freddy gives you some vague ass dialogue to ponder upon, and after seeing an amalgamation of all the past FNAF characters in one blob, okay, we fall beneath the pizzeria, revealing that Springtrap is alive again. 
again! Oh my god, that's so dumb. The fight actually has some nice FNAF action, combining things from the first three games. You have to find where Spring Trap is in the cameras just like FNAF 3, and with the push of a button, burn him alive to activate his PTSD. You also have to close doors on animatronics FNAF 1 style, hide from enemies using Freddy FNAF 2 style, and try to survive it all whilst an immense amount of bugs and shitty AI ruin the experience for you, security breach style. After the boss fight, you see Burn Trap, as people have started to call him, get supposedly killed again only a few minutes after his rebirth by the amalgamation blob of animatronics, and Freddy and Gregory escape the pizzaplex for good. Finishing off the story of Security Breach. Bruh. I'm actually gonna talk about the overarching lore for like two seconds, so if you don't understand it, sorry. This ending just feels like the quickest way they could find into getting a climactic ending for the game. There's been a popular theory going around that Gregory is supposed to be the crying child, Glamrock Freddy is supposed to be Michael reincarnated, and Burn Trap is obviously William. This boss fight is supposed to be the climactic final reunion, where the brothers are able to finally get revenge on their father and can live out the rest of their robot lives as a family again. But it just all feels so anticlimactic. William has died multiple times at this point already, and he's already gotten killed by Michael at least once, so what's the point of bringing him back just to get killed again two minutes later? The true ending feels like they didn't have an actual ending for the game, and just rehashed the ending of FNAF 6, but way more rushed and way worse. If you couldn't tell, I heavily dislike Security Breach. I just feel like there are hardly any redeeming qualities in this game, and there's really nothing there for anyone. For people who like horror games, Games, this game doesn't have any horror in it, concept, character, or gameplay wise, only mostly unnecessary jump scares. For people who like action games, this game doesn't have any action. For the people who like stealth games, this game offers the bare minimum for a stealth game, but that aspect gets ruined too because of the animatronics that can just teleport behind you after getting caught, so strategizing is pointless. For people who still enjoy FNAF's lore, this game adds basically nothing but useless fluff into the lore of a franchise that's already filled to the brim with useless fluff whilst answering nothing. For the people like me, who wanted some of that classic FNAF ambience, there's absolutely none to be found, and for the people who wanted at least a functioning fucking game, don't get what they want either because of the massive amount of bugs and optimization issues. The boring gameplay, the underutilized areas and characters, the jump scares that are the cheapest in the series so far, the lack of explanation for any of the things that happen in the game, the world and endings that feel disconnected from everything you did, the inconsistency of everything, the massive amount of bugs, and the general feeling that this game is just some parts. Scraps of a game that could have been make Security Breach a terrible mess that I consider to be the rock bottom of FNAF games. But it does have a certain charm. Surprisingly enough, I don't completely despise this game. There are a few things that I actually like, so let's go through them. Firstly, the environment. The Pizzaplex is a cool environment that clearly had a lot of thought and effort put behind it. There's so many cool sections to the place and it is gigantic, so it's a shame how it feels like they had plans to do so much more with the area, but ended up kinda half-assing the usage of this interesting environment. Also, the visuals could look pretty damn good if you were able to look at the game with settings higher than the absolute lowest, and the beginning and ending cutscenes look amazing. So if this game was just optimized better, I'd say that Security Breach's visuals would also be a highlight of this game. Also, the sound design, voice acting, and music are all very solid. There are also a few sections of the game that are actually kind of nice. There's the section with the Weeping Angel Endos, the part where you run away from Eyeless Roxy, and the lead up to the arguably bad Burn Trap fight. All of these sections were cool, and they all made me think that this is what the game should have been more like. But yeah, that's all the good I have to say about this game. I know everyone said this already, but there's glimmers of hope in the middle of this mess of a game that show potential. If they just had the necessary time to polish up everything and create the game they wanted to create, since, let's be honest, this was not their full vision of the game and its contents, I think it could have been a relatively fun action game that could have taken the series down a more action-oriented mainstream path in a good way. It still wouldn't have been scary though, because look at these fucking things, but due to what I can only assume to be time constraints, Steel Wolves' full vision of the game was left in the dust and all we got was this pathetic attempt at a video game. Overall, I think Security Breach is an awful game, although I can admit the game's got potential. Too bad that potential will most likely never be fulfilled, but I am not condemning this game to an eternal state of shit, since who knows, maybe after the release of the DLC the game could become another one of those No Man's Sky type of situations. <laughs> yeah, no, but the people who actually care about this game can always dream. On the FNAF scale, trademark, Security Breach is going to the bottom of the list. It's an F-tier game, and it's pretty unfortunate we have to end the mainline FNAF games on such a negative note.
Don't worry, we're out of the game soon. There's just a few more tiny games that I have to mention here, so let's get through them real quick. Firstly, there's the troll games that Scott made during the FNAF 3 to UCN era, where he made supposed teasers and demos for upcoming FNAF games, only for them to end up being intentionally bad games that look like they were made by me or some of his old games with a FNAF skin on top of them. These troll games include FNAF 3 Game Jolt Edition, that was released after Scott said that someone had hacked him and released FNAF 3 early on Game Jolt, but ended up just being a Freddy Reese skin of one of his old games Games, there is no pause button. There was the troll game that was supposed to be FNAF World's second large update, FNAF World Halloween Edition, which was just a shitty tiny pixel art game. There was the mature demo of Sist Location, since back in the day Scott had said that he wanted to delay the making of Sist Location a bit due to him feeling uncomfortable with how mature he'd made the game. So people made up a genuine theory about the fact that the robots of Sist Location were sex dolls. I'm not fucking joking. So in obvious protest, Scott released this demo of what the mature version of this location would have looked like, but that ended up just being another one of his old games with a Freddy reskin, Sit and Survive. And finally, there was the Ultimate Custom Night demo that Scott made purely to piss off the impatient people who'd been asking for a demo version of UCN during its production. But lo and behold, it wasn't actually what it was advertised to be. On top of these troll games, there were two actual games thrown in there for various reasons. First, there was Freddy in Space 2, which was made purely for Game Theory's 2019 St. Jude's livestream, where you play as Freddy trying to get to this robot who's taken over the world to save your son of some shit. The story or the premise of the game don't really matter. All that matters is that this is a 2D shooter where you collect money in four distinct levels. And during the first ever playthrough Game Theory did on their livestream, however much money they found inside the game, Scott would donate that exact same amount to their charity stream. It was a cool idea to get people interested in the stream back then, and even now, now, it's a neat little game that can keep you entertained for an hour or two. Then there's also Security Breach, Fury's Rage, that was made in similar fashion to the UCN demo, since people were getting impatient with the constant delays of Security Breach and wanted to have some new content during this wait. But unlike the UCN demo, Scott actually gave something to the people, a very basic 4 level long beat em up that follows JoJo fight versions of the main cast of Security Breach. In a similar fashion to Freddy in Space 2, it's an okay game that'll keep you entertained for like an hour. Not much to say about it. And that's all the official FNAF games that exist at this current moment covered. I think FNAF's had a pretty rocky road so far, with genuinely fun and good experiences mixed in between very mediocre or outright bad games. The game started out strong with the original trilogy, but then just kinda started to go downhill from there with a few diamonds in the rough. And currently, I feel like this series is at rock bottom with Security Breach. And whilst I'm glad the series has come this far so we could get games like Sister Location of FNAF VR, I still do believe the series should have ended at 3. To cap off the game section, let's take a final look at my official FNAF scale trademark. So at S tier, we got FNAF VR. Very close behind, on A tier, there's FNAF 1, and on a low A tier, we have Sist Location. At B tier, we have FNAF 2, 4, and UCN. In C tier, we got FNAF 6 and 3. FNAF World and FNAF AR are on D tier, and Security Breach is at the lowest, F tier. Do you agree or disagree with me on this ranking? Comment down below, and I won't care, but it'll generate more analytics for this video. And so, I'm done with the games, well, like a third of the way through the video. You're like books. To be honest, I personally didn't expect books to be the next medium that FNAF would infest itself into, but thinking about it a bit more, the concept of kids being stuffed into animatronics and the general world of FNAF could lend well to a book adaptation or two. So they made 17 of them. It all started with just one novel, The Silver Eyes, being released in 2015 and growing into a trilogy over the next few years. Directly after that came the Fazbear Frights books, 12 books all containing three short stories inside a parallel universe that vaguely connects to the games, with even more coming out at some point in the future under a new name, Tales of the Pizza Plex. Then there's a few miscellaneous ones that I'll get to later, but anyway. I read almost every single one of these books, and I'm about to give you an in-depth explanation about every single one of them. God help us all.
The Silverize trilogy was started with a book of the same name in 2015, and over the years got two extra adaptations to it, The Twisted Ones in 2017 and The Fourth Closet in 2018. All three books follow one cohesive storyline that spans across them all, and not gonna lie, most parts of the books are pretty uninteresting. So to spare the people interested in these books from actually having to read them, I thought I could give you a synopsis of the entire Silver Eyes trilogy story. I'll put a thing in the top left corner showing you which parts of the story are from which book. Let's get to it. Yeah, never mind. So turns out that making a visual representation of an entire book and explaining it in detail is very not allowed and could possibly get this video taken down. So I'm just gonna give you a vague, copyright-free, very general synopsis of what happens in the book and then cut straight into my final thoughts. So the story of the Silver Eyes trilogy revolves around a girl named Charlie and her friends who have been recently reunited in their hometown of Hurricane Utah to celebrate the launch of a scholarship program. And for shits and giggles, they just decide to go back to the old, now abandoned Freddy Fazbear's that Hurricane had. And then after that, the books follow the story of Charlie and the people she meets along the way of her strange journey, uncovering the mysteries of Freddy's and the people who built it. And that's like the very basics of the Silver Eyes story, so uh, unfortunately this section of the video is definitely now more so for the people who have read these books, when my initial intention was for it to be like a section for kinda everybody, but unfortunately copyright and I'm a bad p script writer and stupid and didn't realize this until the very last minute. So yeah, sorry, now cut to the final thoughts I have, also there will be some spoilers in there about the endings. That was not very good. This was one one of the strangest pieces of media I have consumed in the past few years, and it was really really disappointing. I think the first book was genuinely great, since it took the interesting parts of FNAF, aka its universe, premise and characters, showed it all from a fresh perspective, and cut out some of the useless fluff that had accumulated in the games. I think if The Silver Eyes was the only book released from these three, it could have been one of my favorite things to come out of this franchise. Silver Eyes was surprisingly good, in my opinion, and even though there were some issues, like some useless padding here and there, and plot points that didn't go anywhere, Anywhere, it was a really strong start to the series. It gave a simple and cool story about an interesting concept, without the complications of the actual FNAF story. And I liked it a lot. But then they had to go and fuck it all up. The Twisted Ones was just a useless mess, in my opinion. Again, it started out really strong and I was still feeling positive about how it could turn out because of how good Silver Eyes was. But after the halfway point, I realized this story isn't really going anywhere. This was the shortest book in the trilogy, and it still felt like 70% of it was utterly useless padding. The concepts got way too out there way too fast, and they also just gave up on a few characters from the previous book, like Jason and Lamar. It was just really bad, confusing confusing and mostly useless. And the worst thing is, is that it led to the fourth closet, which is the worst book in the trilogy that turned shit up to 11 for absolutely no reason. The thing I liked about this trilogy initially was how relatively grounded it stayed, at least in the Silver Eyes. A simple FNAF story not too far-fetched from reality apart from the ghosts and shit was exactly what I wanted. Then things escalated in Twisted Ones to the point where I started to not enjoy it at all, and then it got fucking idiotic during the fourth closet. So Charlie is actually four robots or something like that. Baby was supposed to be the fourth but got possessed by Elizabeth somehow after and tried to become immortal for some reason crayons make kids understand Afton is evil, the continued use of the frequency discs, all of it was just fucking exhausting to read through. The book gives you way too many things to wrap your head around and accept as truth too fast. None of it makes sense, and it got to the point where I just didn't register half of the shit that was being said, since I knew it wasn't going to make sense anyway. And that ending, dearie me. That ending screwed up everything in this series for me, since it did the thing that I hate the most about FNAF. It just gave more questions and actually answered fuck all. This was supposed to be the conclusion, and all I was left with was a feeling of confusion. I rhymed again, <laughs> damn it. I really hate how everything in this series just has to be made convoluted and confusing as fuck for absolutely no reason. They could have just given us a simple story about some dead kids and the guy who murdered them, but instead we got a story that more resembles Inco 
incoherent blabberings. The thing that annoys me the most about this trilogy is that it started out so good. I'd give Silver Eyes an 8.5 out of 10. It was a really entertaining book, but then it just went to shit with the next books being like 3 out of 10 and 2 out of 10. They were just so bad. Overall, I think the Silver Eyes trilogy was an attempt at a different style of FNAF story that falls apart immediately after the first book, and it was not too fun to get through. I know I'm sounding really harsh, but that's mostly just because I hate how much potential this trilogy had, only for it to be thrown away completely in the second and third books. Uh, but yeah, I've got about 12 more books to go through, ha 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 ha. So after the disappointment that was the Silver Eyes trilogy, I turned my gaze towards the Fazbear Fright series. This book series is a whole lot different to the trilogy, since instead of telling one big coherent story, every book has three separate mini stories that take place in the same universe. I was kinda dreading this part of the video, since instead of just having three average sized novels to get through, I had 12 entire books to listen to. And because I firmly believe no one should have to go through the literal weeks it took me to get through all of these stories, just like with the Silver Eyes, I will be giving you short explanations of every single story in every single book. And after each story, I'll be giving my opinions on said story. So let's start off with the first story of the first book, Fazbear Frights 1, Into the Pit. Hey, guess who was an idiot and did the same thing with this section too as the Silver Eyes trilogy? Ah! So because of the exact same problems I had with the Silver Eyes Trilogy section summary, I cannot show you the summaries of any of these Fazbear Fright stories. For this video itself, I'm just gonna do the exact same thing as I did with the Silver Eyes Trilogy and cut straight to my final thoughts. And with that, I've somehow gotten through every single story in Fazbear Frights. Overall, I enjoyed the Fazbear Frights books a lot. The short story format works for FNAF way better than a conventional book, since it allows for more fun and less grounded stories. They were very nice and a fun departure from the Silver Eyes trilogy. And of course, since I enjoy ranking shit so much, here's my rankings for every book in the series. And to cap this book section off, I want to mention the few miscellaneous books that I couldn't fit anywhere else in this video. So firstly, there's the Freddy Files, a surprisingly detailed guidebook on the first five FNAF games and the Silver Eyes trilogy. It gives you trivia about the books and games that would probably go on the surface level of an iceberg video, and gives you fairly detailed tips and tricks on how to beat the first five games. These tips, much like the trivia, aren't anything you couldn't figure out yourself after some trial and error, but having them laid out like this is quite nice. The book is also filled with a lot of custom art and attempts at humor, so if you want a concise package of lore and tactics for the first five games and the novel trilogy, go look at the FNAF wiki. But if you want pretty pictures to go along with that info, this book seems solid. And then there's the Survival Logbook, a children's activity book that's filled with a plethora of activities relating to FNAF. This book would have probably been forgotten by now if it wasn't for the fact that it, of course, had big lore reveals hidden inside of it. Which I think is stupid, but oh well, knock yourself out. Do a crossword or two whilst trying to figure out what the hell this series means. And so, all the books that are currently out have been covered. That was a fucking journey that started out as intriguing but then quickly turned into disappointing, only to be turned to 11 and becoming interesting again with a few bumps in the road, and finally ending with two books that consist of things you could have just looked up for free online. Books weren't really something I thought could work when it comes to this franchise, but as the Silver Eyes book and some of the Fast Bear Fright stories showed, the universe of FNAF makes for a lot of interesting book possibilities. I feel like the original Silver Eyes got the closest to being great, but unfortunately, just like the games, it and the rest of the books got kinda ruined with the addition of uselessly confusing lore. But I've talked about that enough already. Overall, the books turned out to be quite fun, and they also forced me to read for once, which I think is a good thing. You know, after that, I think I could relax a bit. Anyone wanna watch a movie? Oh my god, cause FNAF has movies about it, kinda. On top of books, another medium of media that didn't feel very fitting for this franchise but is happening anyway, 
is a movie. In April of 2015, Warner Brothers acquired the film rights to FNAF, making the first mention of an official FNAF movie seven years old. And after the seven whole years, we've basically gotten nowhere. One of the first things hindering the production of this movie was the sudden studio change from Warner Brothers to Blumhouse Productions due to Scott disagreeing on certain decisions Warner made when it came to the movie. But most people thought this change was a good decision since Blumhouse is much more used to making indie horror films and could probably make a movie about an indie horror game much better than four brothers who aren't even alive anymore. But after that, practically nothing has happened. Scott kept updating Reddit for a good while about the production of the movie, but all that could be taken from these posts was that Scott wasn't happy with any script they could come up with, leaving the movie in a strange grey area of maybe happening someday, possibly. And currently, this area is stranger and greyer than ever, since there is not a confirmed director for the movie anymore, despite many having that title in the past, and in general, considering how the making of this movie has barely advanced in the last seven years, the idea of a FNAF movie ever happening has just become a dream at this point. But the dream of a FNAF style movie wasn't dead yet, since corporate loopholes are a thing. As you just heard, initially Warner Bros was supposed to produce the FNAF movie, but then didn't. And whilst Warner Bros was now lacking the popular IP itself, they did have drafts of the original FNAF movie scripts, and essentially used one of those drafts to create the most mediocre movie you can think of, the Banana Splits movie. The Banana Splits movie follows, surprisingly enough, the Banana Splits, who are actually based off of a Hanna-Barbera show of the same name. The gang consists of Fleagle, Bingo, Drooper, and Snorky, which sound like the names of diseases, and the movie's initial main character, Harley, loves them. For his birthday, his family, featuring overprotective mother, angsty but in PG teen, and a father, which essentially caught me off guard since it seems like no one in this fucking series has a father figure, decide to take him to see the splits live. So all the characters get let in and the show starts. And during the show itself, which is nothing special, we get some awesome character moments, aka we learn that everyone's a shithead. Then things start to go haywire, since before the show, Drooper started acting strange. So the guy responsible for creating the robots decides to give him a little upgrade. And whoop, the robot's evil now for no apparent reason. And then the rest of the movie happens, which I can't show or talk about because of copyright, so let's cut straight to my final thoughts. I must say, if this was one of the scripts for the official FNAF movie originally, I am so glad they didn't go through with it since this movie is so mediocre. This could have been easily a fun animatronic slasher flick with just the right amount of corniness and self-awareness that is needed to make something like that work. Or they could have easily turned the movie into something emotional and more on the psychological side if they focused on the more serious stuff. But they kinda don't go down either of those paths and just end up in a weird middle ground where a part of the movie movie tries to get you to take it seriously, whilst the other is corny and stupid and it just turns into the most okay movie I've ever seen. There's also a lot of just accept this is happening because it's a horror movie moments that I don't really like because it undermines the potential of the genre of horror movies, but that's me getting off track. The Banana Splits movie is a strange adventure that left me feeling very neutral. I got nothing much else to say about it. It was a very big 5 out of 10. But oh boy are we not done with the movies yet, cause the best is yet to come. Stick around on Disney Channel. <laughs> The story of Willy's Wonderland follows Nick Cage. His character doesn't have a name and doesn't talk, so that's what I'm calling him, who gets in a very convenient accident that leaves him stranded in bumfuck Hayesville, Nevada. The friendly folks over at the local town offer to fix Nick's car for him, but it'll cost money, which they only accept in cash, and no one has cash anymore, so the only option for Nick Cage is to do some dirty work for the town if he ever wants to leave. But coincidentally, an old kid's restaurant named Willy's Wonderland needs a cleaning for it soon, to be grand reopening. If Nick Cage cleans up the place for a night, he'll have his car back on the road without having to pay. Nick Cage accepts this job, walks inside, and is met with the friendly faces of the Willy Gang, and no, I will not change that name. Nick Cage doesn't seem to be bothered, but they're clearly meant to get bothered by robots and starts his shift. 
he cleans the place up. But then shit obviously has to go down and the animatronics start bothering him. But it turns out he is an absolute badass and can destroy these animatronics with his pinky finger. And so after just getting smacked a little bit by the first animatronic to activate, Ozzy Ostrich, Nick Cage just beats the shit out of it and continues working like nothing happened. I kinda wish the entire movie could have just been Nick Cage beating the shit out of robots, but we gotta have some other characters and actual development in the story, so we get introduced to Lib, a troublemaker who with the help of her fellow teens has tried to destroy Willy's Wonderland for a good few times now. During their latest attempt, they see Nick Cage inside, and despite the teens' warnings to leave the building, Nick Cage just continues his work. Liv will not light the place on fire with a person inside, and decides she'll get Nick Cage out herself. Comedic antics ensue, and so they all end up falling inside the restaurant. And then the rest of them. This is one of the wackiest, goofiest, and outright shittiest movies I've seen in a while. But it's all of those things in the best way possible. The beginning makes it seem like this is gonna be another banana splits type situation. With the first scene being really dramatic and suspenseful, even though you know the movie's gonna be anything but that. But immediately after this scene, you can see that this movie isn't trying to get you to take it seriously. It embraces the corniness with its cliche and stupid premise and cinematography. And after shit starts going down with the animatronics, it's even funnier, because instead of a badass main character brutally destroying terrifying animatronics, it looks like a drunken man beating people in mascot costumes. Obviously, they try to add in some actual serious stuff with the teens and the lore of the county, but that's precisely where this movie falls apart, because it's not a good movie in regular movie standards. It tries to do simple things like story and emotional beats, but the beats that aren't funny don't hit in the slightest since I don't give a fuck about anyone except Nick Cage, and the story is the dumbest thing ever, since, again, the entire movie could have been avoided with the pull of a trigger, so the backstory, and therefore story of this movie, falls completely flat. Compared to the banana splits, even though I objectively think this is a worse movie, I still like Willy's Wonderland more. First off, the characters have more personality, meaning everyone has the personality of a wet tissue, whilst the banana splits characters have the personality of cardboard. The difference is small, but big enough to notice. Secondly, this movie managed to do its job and actually scare me a singular time with the crocodile bent jump scare. It wasn't a good jump scare and I shouldn't have gotten scared by it, but I somehow did so it counts. And thirdly, it was just way more fun to watch because of how dumb it was. I genuinely enjoyed my time with Willy's Wonderland, unlike Banana Splits, because most of the movie was the silliest turn your brain off fun shit ever. Yeah, it clearly wasn't a very thought through or good movie by any standards, but it was stupid and it was fun. I can't give Willy's Wonderland anything above a 6 out of 10 in good conscience, but goddamn that was so fucking fun to watch and for that I kinda love it. And with that, we've gotten to the end of the movies. Yeah, you'd think there'd be way more movies inspired by FNAF considering the appeal of the concept and the money this thing can bring in, but the Banana Splits movie and Willy's Wonderland are the only ones to have experimented with this concept so far. I mean, there are tens of fan-made movies on the internet, but bugger off, I'm not watching all those. If I had to choose which direction I'd like the real FNAF film to go towards, I'd say I'd rather have the FNAF movie attempt to be more serious. The story of the Aftons could lead to some actually great moments in a movie, and could maybe make people feel an emotion or two about the series for once, and if it falls flat on its face, it would at least be funny. Going through these movies was a pretty pleasant experience, since it didn't take weeks of my life away unlike the other parts of this video, and it gave me some insight as to what the FNAF movie could actually be like when it finally comes out, probably not in our lifetime. I don't know how to move on to the next section. Transition! <laughs> Considering everything that I've talked about so far, I can safely say that FNAF is one of the most successful indie horror games ever, and I think that is mostly thanks to the highly committed community around this series. But what kind of community could the FNAF community possibly be? Probably horror fans that enjoy the atmosphere and can appreciate the design of the gameplay loop in each game, even though compared to many other games, it is quite simple. It's kids. It's mostly kids. They like the funny Fazbear, what can I say? Kids like doing stuff they shouldn't be doing, and FNAF is the perfect series for that kind of rebellious behavior. FNAF provides children with a relatively simple and not too heavy introduction to the world of horror, with the concepts and character designs being scary enough, but not too scary to never want to look at them again. Also, the only truly heavy topic FNAF covers is murder, 
which is just cool enough for some fourth grader to flex with knowing about, but not too complex to get boring, like most psychological horror games. The point is, FNAF is an easy path into the world of horror for kids, and whenever kids get interested in something, that thing usually becomes the only thing they are interested in, which is my hypothetical reasoning for why FNAF has remained so popular over the years. Since kids on the internet are the strongest goddamn force on this planet, and can give 10 million views easily to a video that took 10 minutes to make. Sorry, just wanted to get that rant out there. Also, let's not acknowledge the fact that I'm barely old enough to be talking about kids in the manner that I did, but mentally I'm 67, so piss off. Of course, there are people of all ages who are super interested in FNAF and its world, and these people have shared the game everywhere, created fan art, music, fan games, and more. This series' driving force is the community, who's carried the game with their infinite enthusiasm to nine whole ass installments. It is insane how dedicated a following this franchise has, and it shows off just how much passion people can have for something as simple as an indie game. Communities have the power to create careers and give opportunities to aspiring artists, game developers, and YouTubers, and FNAF's community is no exception. The scale and power of it is terrifying, but also very intriguing. And to further demonstrate just how influential this franchise has been, I'd like to show off what I think to be the coolest way the fans of FNAF have shown their appreciation for the original franchise. Oh, someone turned on the VHS player. Like most communities, the FNAF community has experienced quieter moments where it felt like the game could be dying out, but year after year, something always manages to resurface that intrigue of fans with something new and fresh. And in 2020, that thing was the FNAF VHS tape series by Squimpus McGrimpus, a series of videos meant to look like old VHS tapes from the 1980s featuring characters and story elements from the FNAF games. Almost every tape starts off by showing an in-universe video of some sort, like a guide on how to repair an animatronic, a pre-show video for a show at the pizzeria, or some security footage of the various locations. But at the end of almost every single video, there is corruption of some kind that gives the viewer tidbits of info about this universe, or simply something scary. This was such a cool idea at the time, since no one had done it before. Yet the idea of corrupted tapes about Freddy's makes perfect sense, since of course they would have had training videos and security footage like this back in the day. The relatively simple pattern of quiet first, then chaotic could easily get boring, but the pacing of this shit is so good. The videos are only a few minutes long, with the longest one being a mere seven, but the pacing of it all makes it feel like you've watched a fucking movie by the end of the series. It manages to make every second last in the best way possible, and what is in reality about 10 seconds can sometimes feel like minutes because of the unnerving feelings of dread these tapes emit that make you question what's gonna happen next. The main thing that impresses me about this series is that there are hardly any jump scares, and there's only one that I can recall that felt cheap and like there wasn't much thought put behind it. Instead, the tapes give you feelings of anxiety. Everything is so calm and slow most of the time. It should lull you into a false sense of security, but doesn't because of the constant feeling that something's about to jump at you. And the payoffs in each video for wading through the painstakingly long seconds are great. It's always either chaos or somber, and they're both equally terrifying. It's honestly really refreshing to feel scared by something FNAF related for once, not just from the jump scares, but the topics and feelings alone. FNAF has not done that for me in a long time, so the fact that this series manages to bring back a feeling to FNAF I never thought I'd feel again scared is very impressive to me. In general, this series feels like what FNAF should have been. It doesn't rely on jump scares and instead focuses on the themes and ideas of the series that get way too overlooked in the actual games. It fleshes out the very few characters in the series, which the games don't really do, and oh my god, it finishes the fucking story. I really want to talk about the story of this thing, so if you want to go watch these tapes yourself, go do it right now. This is your final warning before I get into spoiler territory. The story of these tapes revolves around the first three games, and basically ends the series in the place it was supposed to end in originally, with a few twists here and there. This story revolves around Michael Afton and his life. 
He was neglected and tormented by his father William throughout his childhood, whilst his younger brother Joseph was always praised, which made Michael despise both of them. During Joseph's ninth birthday party, Michael, being the devious child that he was, decides to pull a silly little prank on his brother and stuffs him into Fredbear's mouth, causing the animatronic to bite down on Joseph's head, killing him. The slightly less harmful than expected prank made William despise Michael more than ever, but he couldn't kill his only son since he would obviously get caught, so he decides to kill other children similar to Michael inside of Freddy's instead. After five murders, William gets kicked out of Freddy's and the events of the games happen in between. FNAF 2 happens, the call for animatronics and the puppet get possessed, Freddy's gets shut down due to the animatronics leaking blood, William goes to destroy the suit, spring lock failure, yada yada yada. And then we get to the contents of the tapes themselves. It turns out Michael has been the one viewing these tapes the entire time, whilst the puppet and Joseph, now Golden Freddy, communicate all the events that perspired after Joseph's death to him. After getting the truth revealed to him, Michael, with the help of the puppet, goes to Fazbear's Fright where Springtrap remains to burn his ass down alongside the attraction. The thing goes skrra, pa 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 pa. The souls of everyone get set free and William goes to hell never to be seen again. Why couldn't the games be like this? The story is so simple and told in such a unique way. Apart from the last two tapes which are just exposition dumps, the tapes give you subtle hints as to what's happening, like the games, but they don't leave out too much or add something unnecessary that could potentially ruin the entire lore, unlike the games. And even though the story at the end of the day isn't anything phenomenal, I think the reason it resonates with me so much is it finally gives that feeling of satisfaction I think we will never truly get from the mainline games, because I don't think the story of the games themselves will ever end in a good way anymore. Now, like everything on this planet, this series ain't perfect. I mean, look at this fucking thing and tell me that's scary. Some of the images look stupid, and the tapes can also get quite overwhelming with the flashing lights and sometimes unnecessary noises. But even though this series isn't perfect, it's really close. It does everything I think FNAF should have done. It elevates the children being trapped inside the animatronics idea and humanizes basically every character in the franchise. It gives a conclusion to the fucking story, shows you the perfect amount of info to gather the story together yourself without having to look through 18 bloody books, it's actually kind of scary, and god I wish FNAF was like this still. It just comes to show that people enjoy the core ideas of the series to this day due to how much potential they had, and that potential can still be harnessed. But Squimpus's tapes are basically a reimagining of the original story, and whilst it does an amazing job at that, it is just a slightly modified retelling of the same story we've heard over and over again. So what if this concept of FNAF VHS was taken a bit further and a completely original universe was created? The Walton Files is a series created by Martin Walls that follows the FNAF VHS pattern set by Squimpus, but in its own universe with original characters and a unique art style. The tapes revolve around the families of the creators of Bunny Smiles Inc., this series' version of Freddy's, Jack Walton and Felix Kranken, and how a few mistakes led them down probably the worst path that things could have gone down. There are currently only three official tapes out, but these tapes are almost, if not as packed with ideas and lore, as all of Scrimpus's tapes. There's in-universe cartoons of the company's characters, training videos and PSAs, found footage style videos showing workers dealing with the old animatronics that have been stored away, etc. The amount of stuff packed inside these tapes is pretty insane, and although I'd like to go more detail about the contents of the tapes and the lore behind them, I'm not actually gonna do that. As I said, there's only three tapes out currently, and Martin Walls has made it clear that the story is not completed yet, nor should the full story try to be solved at this point. And I don't want to only talk about a part of a story, so I'll leave the lore telling of this series to somebody else. But just so you know, I have a gigantic notepad file about the story of this series because each episode is so packed full of stuff, so good luck if you're gonna try to get through the lore of this like me. But even if you don't care about their story, the tapes are really fun to watch in general. The eerie mix of 2D and IRL footage makes for some really unique looking scenarios and characters, and that's actually what initially drove me to watch this series. It looks very unique, and when it wants to get scary, it gets scary. The tapes can occasionally look stupid, just like the Squimpus tapes, but when a scene hits, 
Eh, it's hard. The unique art style paired up with the OST, yes, these tapes have original soundtracks to them, makes this a fun series to just watch through without thinking of further lore implications. Also, the amount of effort that gets put into these videos is insane. The first video is quite standard. Seven minutes of well-made and jam-packed footage. Their second one expands on this a bit with 14 minutes of similar quality content. But then we get to Walton Falls 3, Bunny Farm, which is 58 minutes long. This tape alone took me an entire day to deconstruct, and I must say it was fun as hell, because just like with the Scrimpus tapes, the pacing of the Walton Files is stellar. There are quite a lot of jump scares in this series, and some of them don't feel earned. There's a few sequences that drag out a bit too long, and also ow my ears, but other than that, I don't have almost any complaints about this series. Even though I had a bit less to say about the Walton Files than the Scrimpus tapes, I personally like the Walton Files more, and the only reason I've stopped my from talking about it any further is because it's not finished, so there isn't that much to say yet, and also because I want you to go watch these tapes for yourself. They're so good. Now to the rest of the community things. FNAF's community has made it the thing it is today, for better or for worse. It has spawned a lot of good in the past, but just like all fandoms, it's not all good and fun. So firstly, there's the size of the fandom. Whenever anything gets popular on the internet, it gets its fair share of good and toxic fans. And although usually the good ones outweigh the toxic ones, the toxic ones are always the loudest, leading to the usual issues that a fandom can have. You cannot dislike anything about the games without a toddler calling you slurs, there's inevitably gonna be a point where the toxic fans become so loud you cannot escape the series into any corner of the internet, and then there's also the general harassment and shitty behavior. But even though this kind of toxicity still exists and will forever exist in FNAF's community, it doesn't, and shouldn't, undermine all the good things that have come from the series in the past. It ain't no bad, despite how much of a bitter bitch I've been for the past minute. So FNAF has had a gigantic cultural impact on the world. That much is evident by now. What started out as a tiny indie game has become something so goddamn big I cannot even begin to describe it. It hasn't grown to the size of mainstream games like Mario and whatnot, but if I went to the local pub and started talking about FNAF, someone would absolutely say, Oh, I've heard that name somewhere before. Maybe. And that is enough to say that this thing has had quite the impact on the culture of gaming, the horror genre, the internet, and the world in general. And that includes memes. <laughs> Yes, that entire section was just a segue into this topic, get stuffed. Also, there's no way I won't sound like an absolute ash pile whilst talking about this. Memes. I enjoy a meme or two every once in a while, and by the looks of it, so do most people on this planet at this point. And obviously FNAF found its way into the cesspool that is memes by being a game that was made popular entirely by the internet. It started out as the basic top text bottom text, but unironically, memes in 2015 when life was better, and most people really thought FNAF would stay there when it comes to memes, and for the longest time you didn't see FNAF memes anywhere, and most people, including myself, considered this a good thing. But then, around 2018 or so, the ironic meme started to rise. FNAF fit into this category of ironic perfectly, since it's a game franchise tainted by a bad community that's considered cringe, as the kids nowadays say, so it's easy to make fun of. But many people also still have a fondness for it, meaning a lot of people could express this fondness through something that doesn't actually show they liked FNAF at some point. It works kinda perfectly, and this exposure through memes has sort of given the game a title of eternally lasting, since the game sure as hell ain't going away and the memes have only amplified its presence on the internet and will most likely keep going until we get to a point where ironic memes aren't a thing anymore and we just go back to wanting to show our appreciation for our childhoods, at which point FNAF will be inescapable again, and did I mention I cannot escape this goddamn series anymore? There is
is this YouTuber called Super Eyepatch Wolf, who makes content quite similar to mine. He makes video essays about the things he enjoys or has a particular interest in. And he's one of my favorite YouTubers on the platform due to his unique video style and the amount of emotion and drama he can create from the stupidest of concepts. And my absolute favorite video from him is his hour and a half long video about Garfield. Look, I swear this is gonna make sense, just hang on, okay? You see, Garfield has gained a strange cult-like following on the internet during these past few years, and people have created the most morbid yet intriguing things around this orange cat, purely based on the fact that it would be funny to over-dramatize something that's based on something as simple as a three-strip comic book. And I Patch Wolf made a video on this exact topic, and it's amazing. I've known of Garfield and the other strange things Garfield fans are up to on the internet for a long time, so it wasn't really surprising that I loved this video. Anyway, gushing over that video isn't the point of this. So in the latter half of the video, Eyepatch Wolf discusses the fact that once he started working on his video, he couldn't escape Garfield anymore. He saw it in his favorite TV shows, his everyday life, and even in his past where he thought the Garf couldn't appear. In the video, he calls this thing that absolutely has a proper psychological term to it somewhere, the Garfield Phenomena. Uh, let me tell you, the Garfield phenomena has been happening to me and heart since I started working on this video because I feel like I cannot escape FNAF anymore. It's on my Twitter timeline despite only following a small handful of people relating to FNAF. It's on my YouTube recommendations even though I haven't watched any FNAF related stuff. I see parallels yeah, to the so FNAF story nor media I consume. Me. I see it in my dreams, the store, my paw. The point is FNAF keeps following me everywhere and I feel like I'll never be able to escape it at this point, but I do have a feeling that this Garfield phenomena will wear off at least slightly once this video is finished. So let's do that. Five Nights at Freddy's is a series I have a lot of conflicting thoughts and opinions on, but during the making of this video, I think I've managed to untangle those confusing thoughts into something more manageable in my head, which was one of the goals of this video to me personally. It's been interesting researching everything and looking through all FNAF related media in at least some way shape or form to see where the series started and how it got to where it is today, even if the now of FNAF ain't looking too good. This series was my introduction to horror games when I was young and it was also one of the first game series I started actively following online. And as much as I hate to say it, it did impact my life in more ways than I'd like to admit. And because of that, I begrudgingly pay my respects to this fucking bear and the series of games, books, almost movies, community-made content, but mostly games that it created. On top of the whole unraveling my thoughts, this video serves as my final goodbye to FNAF, because to be honest, I really don't care about FNAF anymore, and I just kinda wanna forget about it and move on to other things. And the only reason I really kept up with it was because I always knew, as I said at the beginning of this video, that I wanted to make a video on FNAF as a final goodbye so I could say my piece and move on. This video has been one hell of a ride for me, and possibly even for you, if you somehow managed to get through the entire video without skipping sections. And if you did, congratulations! You are most likely about as insane as me. This has been the ultimate Five Nights at Freddy's video. Thank you for watching, please do the funny YouTube things, you know, like, comment, and especially subscribe. This video took literal months to make, so I'd like for all my efforts to not go to waste. And Markiplier swears in his Let's Plays of the mainline FNAF games, not including the revisiting series, 3468 times. One proof, here's the Excel sheet. And with that, I leave you. Never associate me with this franchise again. Good night, everybody!